What's up everyone, welcome back to a brand new video. Today we'll be starting a brand new scenario based on an old one that I've made before. A while ago, I made a video talking about if Broly landed on a Namek. It was a full series, and we saw what would happen, well, if Broly landed on a Namek. So today, we're doing something a little bit different. A lot of people on that video were suggesting that I should make one for Goku, having him being sent to Namek instead, and that could actually work out. I just have to change one small detail, and it changes the entire story. Instead of going to Earth, Kakarot is being sent to Namek. We'll be using that prompt and seeing how it affects the entire story. And with all that out of the way, let's begin. Bardock's already suspicious of Frieza. He knows that he's probably going to attack the Saiyan sometime soon, and he wants to make sure Kakarot's at least safe. There's only one way to do it. He needs to send Kakarot to a different planet, at least for the time being. But instead of sending him to Earth, which is a pretty unassuming planet, Bardock decides to send Kakarot to Nam. The good thing is, it's not like it's on anyone's radar yet. Sure, they know of the planet. The Wish Orbs are still rumors now, no one knows that they actually do exist and exist on Namek, so it's not like anyone cares about Namek anyways, he should be safe there. And his decision is made, Kakarot is sent off to Namek. Of course, nothing changes about Bardock's fate, he still ends up facing Frieza, but to no avail. Planet Vegeta is destroyed, and all the Saiyans that were present on the planet are killed as well. But of course not all the Saiyans are dead, besides Kakarot, there are others around the universe, we'll be seeing more of them later on. After some time, Kakarot's pod eventually lands on Namek. And of course, this is a huge surprise to all the Namekians there. Cautiously, they go up to the space pod, and they find a child in it. And based on what he's wearing and how he looks, he must be a Saiyan. At least according to Guru. They have no idea of who he is or why he's here, but Guru could send something out in deep space. Thousands of energies are extinguished at once. And he senses an evil presence. He sensed this not too long before the space pod landed here. Maybe this is a survivor of whatever just happened. Maybe the Saiyans were wiped out. Although he's not too focused on theorizing about that, he's more focused on figuring out why this child is here, and if it's bad news or anything. Saiyans are known for being hostile and destroying planets after all. What if this kid was sent here for that? As expected, he is quite rowdy too. Of course, he's not that powerful, so it's not a concern right now. But this kid must be dealt with somehow. Again, they still don't know why he's here. Maybe it is for a malicious purpose, but it doesn't really seem that way the more they get to see him. If he was actually sent here to destroy the planet or something, why would they send a kid that doesn't even know how to fight yet? Sure, they do know Saiyans are sent out at a young age, but this one, he's not doing anything to them. And given what Guru did sense out in space, maybe he's the last hope for the Saiyans, maybe he's one of the only survivors. But what do they do about him? Do they send him back out into space? Do they kill him? Or do they keep him here and try and raise him somehow? Guru places a hand on the child's head. He could sense some sort of anguish, getting a feel for one of the things Kakarot saw before he was sent here. It seemed like some sort of final goodbye from his parents, maybe. And his name, he knows it now, it's Kakarot. So just like he thought, this is a survivor. He's not here for a malicious purpose. At least, not yet. Knowing how Saiyans are, he might grow up to be that way. But maybe they could change that. It would be nice to have a strong warrior around after all. Of course, they do have people like Nail and other warrior Namekians. But imagine a Saiyan protecting the planet, protecting Guru and the Dragon Balls. Maybe they could change the Saiyans' ways. The Namekians are peaceful after all. It's not like they're just going to kill a random child that comes here even though he seems like a threat. They're pragmatic, they're smart, they know this is the better solution. They could give him a traditional Namekian name, but it seems more fitting for him to stay named Kakarot. He's got to keep at least some of his Saiyan identity after all. So, what now? It's going to be kind of odd raising him, although the Namekians might have a good time doing it. Not only are they very knowledgeable, but they're also pretty strong. They could teach him great things, not only in terms of knowledge, but in terms of fighting abilities. And most importantly, they can create a good Saiyan. Instead of the ruthless warmongers that are known around the galaxy, they can create one that defends peace. Growing up in this different environment will definitely help. But who will help raise him? Guru can't do all the work. But his right-hand man can, Nail. Nail could help train this kid at least, and in terms of knowledge, they have people like Mori and other elder Namekians that could help teach him. He'll also be growing up alongside plenty Namekian children too. So he won't be lonely, this might actually work. And it's decided. Guru thinks they should raise this child. If not for them, then the entire universe. Whatever threat destroyed the Saiyans might actually be coming to them soon enough. Who knows? The Saiyan could be their last hope after all, if that does end up happening. And even if nothing happens, hey, there's still another strong fighter. So the child is sent off to be raised by Nail, as well as the other Namekians around him. Immediately they realize it's a great idea to send him with a warrior Namekian. He is a rowdy child, and it's not like he's going to be hitting his head here and turning good. It's going to be completely nurture that turns him good. Well, at least they hope so. They could overpower his say in nature as long as they try. It's hard to keep this child calm, but they're able to discipline him. And as he grows and learns more, he does show this discipline. He does keep some of his say in nature though, but he's becoming more kind-hearted. As kind-hearted as a Saiyan could be. 
With all this, they're gonna end up creating something really special. He's not gonna be like a traditional evil Saiyan, but he's not gonna be wholly pure like Goku either. It's a completely new personality, Kakarot, the Saiyan raised by Namekians. It's a unique experience for the Namekians to raise him, and as he grows more and more, they see that this is actually working. Thanks to how great Saiyan's memories are, Kakarot does remember Bardock and Gine and everything. He knows what happened to him, he knows why he was here, and he knows everything from his childhood. And with great Namekian knowledge, he's really smart too. Not just in terms of his battle smarts, but his education. And with all his memories in mind, he does have a goal. He doesn't know all the details, but he knows his planet was destroyed. He wants to know who it was that was responsible, and he wants to find them and seek vengeance. Not primarily for selfish reasons, but more so for justice. This is the Namekian side of him shining through. As a Saiyan, he wants vengeance, but as a Namekian, he wants that justice. But he also wonders, are there any others like him? Any other Saiyans that ended up surviving somehow? No one really knows. And he continues living his early life thinking about these things. He and Nail grow a lot closer. Nail is pretty much a father figure to him after all. With Guru there as well, kind of being like a grandfather, I guess. But Nail's also his teacher primarily. Kakarot's grown exponentially as a fighter, not only in terms of his pure strength, but his techniques. Especially in the environment he's growing up in, imagine how much potential he has. Saiyans do grow better in peaceful environments as we've seen. And not to mention, he could do some pretty great training. There's people all around him that could heal him. If he really needs, he could even take advantage of the Saiyan power boots. At first, the Namekians were kind of iffy on the idea of raising a Saiyan, but they've really warmed up to him since then. And now we reach an interesting point in the story. Right about now, Kakarot's a teenager. In terms of power, he's quite strong too. Way stronger than he was originally, actually. Of course, by now, Guru would have unlocked his potential. But beyond that, he's had a bunch of training too. And even though he's weaker than a lot of other warrior Namekians, he's still pretty strong in his own right right now. We'll place him at about 6,000. I think that's fair. It's pretty strong in comparison to where he was originally, but it's not too outrageous given the fact that he's had his potential unlocked and all the training he's got. But in his path to grow stronger, Kakarot finds himself in a detour. One day, a ship shows up on Namek, and it's not any weird alien ship or anything, it's a Namekian ship. No Namekians have gone into space recently, and the ship actually does look pretty old. They wonder what's going on, especially Kakarot. But then a few people step off. One of them is a Namekian, he's very old, and he's alongside two other people that aren't Namekians. A three-eyed man and a really small one. They actually look more like Kakarot than Namekians, if anything. The two guys alongside the Namekians seem pretty tired, and just from how they look, they can sense desperation from them. Namekians go up to greet the people walking off the ship, and they introduce themselves. The Namekian is named Kami. He's the guardian of a planet called Earth. Alongside him is Ten Shinhan and Chaozu, two Earth's strongest martial artists and two of the only fighters left. They explain who they are and why they're here. Let's rewind a bit. Back in Earth, things have gone very differently. Without Goku being part of the story, a lot of things definitely would change. Krillin still ends up going with Roshi to train, and even though the Red Ribbon Army was a threat, they were eventually defeated. Krillin ended up growing stronger and stronger as a martial artist, of course still training under Master Roshi. Eventually in a tournament, he crossed path of Ten Shinhan, where he ended up losing. The Crane School was just too superior, but amidst this bickering, a new enemy arose, someone who was reawakened by the Pilaf Gang. Long before, the Pilaf Gang had their Dragon Ball stolen by the Red Ribbon Army. They never actually got to summon Shenron. But now they have a weapon. They've reawoken King Piccolo. Of course, without Goku there, fighting King Piccolo was a lot harder. Since they were going after tournament contestants, Krillin was one of the first people killed. Roshi tried to seal Piccolo away, but ended up dying. As did Master Shen at the Crane School. The two of them put aside their differences to try and stop this threat, but nothing worked. Of course, Kami saw what was going on, and since the two were lifelinked, he considered killing himself in order to kill King Piccolo. They don't even have Dragon Balls anymore, Shenron was killed by Piccolo. But he had a better idea, something that actually needed him to be alive. There were still two strong martial artists left, and even though they were misguided, they're working for a good cause. Earth is currently being ruled by King Piccolo, and these two seem to be the only hope for Earth. It was Tenshinhan and Chaozu. Kami ended up getting a hold of them, bringing them up to the lookout, and even training them. And they did see some growth, but still, there were a few issues. For one, they weren't growing fast enough. At this rate, more and more people would die. Tenshin and Chaozu felt guilty about it, as if they could work faster and try and save Earth somehow. Even though it wasn't their fault, they still felt responsible for it. But also, there was another factor. Even if they did end up saving Earth against King Piccolo, all the destruction wouldn't be reversible. There would be no Dragon Balls to stop anything. If King Piccolo died, Kami would die. They don't want to risk trying to seal him. They actually need to kill him. Because if they seal him, he could just be reawoken again. 
and that's even if sealing works. But if they kill him, it's not like Kami can create more Dragon Balls. But if he creates more right now, well, King Piccolo will just get them and kill Shenron again. And that gave Kami an idea, a solution. He needs to go to his home planet, Nami. And that's what brought them here now. They wanted to get the Dragon Balls, but also wanted to see if they knew a way to grow stronger. They're also pretty amazed to see Kakarot here. They think he's a human at first, but he doesn't know what they're talking about. He introduces himself. He's a Saiyan. Yeah, he's not like the other Namekians. But being raised by them and taken in by them, he essentially is one at heart. And of course, he and all the Namekians are shocked to hear about this. An evil Namekian going around killing people, destroying an entire planet. Of course, this hits home with Kakarot. And luckily, it seems that the Namekians will be able to help. And even though they were pretty bad before, Kami is glad to see Tenshinhan and Chaozu's growth. Even though it did take these dire conditions to actually make them become good, it's good that they're not misguided anymore. They're working for a noble cause, and they're growing stronger while they're at it. Hopefully once this is all reversed, the Crane School can learn and turn away from these misguided feelings. Kakarot leads the two Earthlings back to Guru's place, while Kami goes to get Dragon Balls with other Namekians. And along the way, Kakarot learns more about the two of them, as well as what's happened on Earth. And he tells them about himself. He assures them that they came to the right place. The Namekians are very hospitable people. And especially with Kami with them, they would definitely be helping one of their own. But they're still confused. Where's Kakarot taking them? Well, he knows they have some great potential. From what Kami said, they sound like great fighters and martial artists. They can become really strong. And the answer to that is Guru. They're brought to Guru, and Guru begins looking into them. He could sense that the two are misguided, but these misguided ways are being overpowered by their noble desire to help protect Earth. They're changing, and they seem to be the last hope for that plan. Guru would be glad to help. He unlocks both of their potentials, making them exponentially stronger than they were before. Even they're surprised at their own strength, never having expected this. It makes Kakarot happy to see it too. That's kind of how he felt when he had his potential unlocked. It brings back some good memories. Of course, they're still not as strong as him, not even close. And with the two of them having their potential unlocked, now they're ready to face King Piccolo. Unfortunately, it seems the Dragon Balls here won't really do too much for them. As they are right now, they're not strong enough to revive groups of people. They can only revive one person at a time. Kami is saddened to hear about this at first, thinking that they have no shot, but then Tenshinhan and Chaozu come back, much stronger than before. This is actually kind of perfect. Even though they can't revive the people here, things will still work out. With this newfound strength, Tenshinhan and Chaozu can defeat King Piccolo. And with the Dragon Balls, Kami used the ones here on Namek to unlink him with Piccolo. This way, they can kill King Piccolo without killing him. And after they kill him, Kami will create a new set of Dragon Balls, using them to wish everyone back. It seems this crisis was averted, and they thank the Namekians, then Shinon and Chaozu thank Kakarot too. This seems like a great place, and they'd love to see these people again, and if they ever need anything, just let the Earthlings know. Not that they could really do too much, but still, the offer is there. And with that, they say their goodbyes. Now I know a lot of you want to see the stuff from Z, but it still is important for me to cover the stuff from Dragon Ball. I can't just forget everything on Earth. And I feel like this would be a realistic turn of events without Goku there. It covers those first few arcs of Dragon Ball, covers what's happening with the Earthlings, and most importantly, brings the Earthlings and Kami into the story. But now we're getting to what I'm sure all of you are waiting for. More time passes. Kakarot, of course, continues his training, living life normally on Namek. Now that he's a young adult, he's learning more about the universe around him. He actually has a lot of aspirations too. He'd love to visit some different planets, not only to see them, but also to learn from them. Maybe there's other techniques he could pick up. More people he can meet. He'd love to go to Earth someday too. And he's really interested in exploring space. He's even considering taking a grand tour, if you will. No, no, not a good joke? Okay, whatever. But it's not all happy. He still wants to figure out what happened with Planet Vegeta, and he hopes that he eventually gets some answers. That's one of the reasons he wants to venture out. He wants to figure out who did it. He can search for strong powers around the universe, not only growing stronger himself, but also figuring out a way to get vengeance. And at one point, he actually does sense a strong power out in space. And it feels malicious. Guru can sense it coming too. It's one strong person heading right to Namek. But something about this power weirds Kakarot out. It's familiar in a way, but then he realizes, wait, what if it's another Saiyan coming to Namek? He's trying to rack his brain. The thing is, he never knew who to sense power before, so he doesn't know who to compare this to, but the power is somewhat similar to his own in a way, like it's a Saiyan, or maybe someone who's blood related. Out in space, the person getting closer and closer to Namek is Raditz. He'll drag his brother along with the Saiyans by force. Kakarot senses the power coming closer and closer to Namek. He's not sure if it's a friend or a foe, but it's likely the latter. It feels a bit malicious, but more concerningly, it feels a bit familiar, and he can't really tell why. But the good thing is, it doesn't seem too incredibly strong, at least in comparison to him and some of the other warrior Namekians. As mentioned last time, of course I'm referring to Raditz. He's heading towards the planet, aiming to recruit Kakarot. And soon after he's sensed, he lands on the planet. 
He doesn't know much about this planet, but from what he does know, it seems that the people are peaceful and there's probably not too many strong people here. It's only Kakarot that he's looking for. But as he takes out his scouter and begins looking for powers, he comes to see that there's actually a bunch of strong people there. As we know, Kakarot isn't even the strongest here. And also, Warrior Namekian should be pretty strong. I mean, look at Nail. His power was 42,000. And if Nail's the strongest of them at 42,000, there's probably other really strong ones, at least with four digit power levels. Even if there's only a few of them, there should be more than enough to overwhelm Raditz, and he comes to learn this right away. The Namekians can tell that he's easily a threat. He's being very aggressive, and it seems like he's here to actually kidnap someone. The most concerning part is that he seems to be a Saiyan just like Kakarot. As Raditz lands, one of the Namekians says to gather the Wish Orbs. He might be after them. Raditz is pretty interested to hear this too. That's not what he was here for, but it's good to know that Wish Orbs exist on this planet. But that's not his main goal right now. It's Kakarot. And from what they know of Saiyans, well, they are bad people. Kakarot's an exception though due to how he was raised. But Raditz is definitely going to be a threat here. Much to Raditz's surprise, not only is he completely overwhelmed, but they even destroy his ship and scout him. The Namekians are fair and peaceful people, so they don't just kill him in cold blood. They actually keep him alive, trying to figure out why he's here, wanting to see if he even truly is a threat. He's getting angered by this. They've captured him and destroyed his mode of transport. All he wants is to find Kakarot. He doesn't want to fight these small frogs, but if he has to, then so be it. At his hand, he charges a fake moon, throwing it up in the sky. The Namekians are confused at first, thinking that he threw up some sort of key attack but then they watch as Raditz begins growing in size, transforming into an Uzari. This could be bad news. Kakarot never had to worry about them. Namek hasn't been shown to have a moon, and it's also been shown to always be daytime there. So likely Kakarot's never encountered this, until now. He's heading over to where he senses this energy, and he even sees the giant ape in the distance. He wonders what's going on. Nail has told him about this ability before, but he's never made use of it, also because it did seem too dangerous. And above that ape, he sees a giant glowing ball. Midair Kakarot stops flying. He begins feeling weird. He feels energy. It's stemming from his tail. His mind goes completely blank, and he begins transforming into a great ape as well. Raditz fends off all the Namekians. Luckily, they don't get killed by him. He's only doing this to escape their grasp so he could find Kakarot, and, in all honesty, Raditz isn't really that strong in great ape either. At least not strong enough to kill a couple warriors casually right away. He sees another Uzaru in the distance. That's him. That's Kakarot. Raditz leaps through the air, landing in front of where Kakarot is. He begins trying to converse with his brother, but Kakarot doesn't respond. He looks at Raditz, and he doesn't say anything. He just growls. Great. He's going to have to retrieve Kakarot by force, isn't he? He doesn't know if Kakarot would even want to join him or not, but he knows what's going on here. Kakarot doesn't know how to control this state. Well, he guesses that makes sense. All the Namekians here are still alive, and if Kakarot actually did do that, well, the Namekians would have been dead by now. This shouldn't be too bad, though. Kakarot has no control, after all. Raditz will be able to defeat him pretty easily. At least he hopes so. But he quickly comes to realize that once again, he is kind of screwed. Even when he's transformed, he's not going to win here. Kakarot is very strong as we discussed the last episode, way stronger than even Raditz is in his base form. And even though Raditz is stronger as a great ape, Kakarot's way stronger too, so it's a double-edged sword. He's strong. Too strong. It doesn't seem like Raditz is able to do anything to counter his brother's attacks. Nothing is working. Thankfully, the attacks are easy to avoid because Kakarot's kind of out of control, but he can't injure him at all. But wait, if Kakarot doesn't know how to control this form, he likely doesn't know about the weakness in his tail. There's no way he's going to be protecting that. So, Raditz takes the opportunity to attack. He goes right for Kakarot's tail, aiming to rip it off, seeing this as the only way to win this fight. The Namekians watch on, still confused and unsure what's happening. It seems like Kakarot's completely inconsolable. Nail even watches on too, trying to figure out any way to stop this. But it seems Raditz already has the idea. He goes right for Kakarot's tail, ripping it clean off. Kakarot shrieks as he transforms, turning back into his base form. Thankfully, he's pretty much uninjured besides his tail being ripped off. Raditz did absolutely no damage to him, although Kakarot has no idea what just happened. He gets up after a bit, still confused, and then he sees a giant ape in front of him. And that was the last thing he remembered seeing. Immediately, Kakarot is hostile. He has no clue what this threat is, but then it clicks with him. This is a Saiyan. He could tell by the armor, and from what the other Namekians are saying. Apparently, he just transformed into one of those things too. But how did he detransform then? It was his tail. It got ripped clean off. So if he wants to do the same to this guy, he's going to have to cut off his tail. Kakarot jumps into the air, asking this guy who he is. But is immediately met by an attack from Raditz. Raditz throws a punch, and Kakarot jumps right over it. Wait a second. This guy isn't that strong. Even as a great ape, he's been weakened a bit by fighting Kakarot. Remember, Kakarot's over 6,000 in terms of power. And as for Raditz, he's about 1,500 and would be 15,000 as a great ape. But with him being weakened, he'd probably be closer to where Kakarot is in terms of strength. Kakarot feels the Saiyan blood pumping. Maybe he could defeat this guy without making him detransform. 
And if that is a way to make him detransform, well, Raditz will know to defend his tail after all. So Kakarot's gonna have to be smarter. He spends some time actually fighting Raditz normally, pretending he doesn't know about the tail thing. Sure, Raditz is huge and threatening, but Kakarot's able to help counter him, and with the help from Nail and other warrior Namekians, Raditz is eventually completely overwhelmed by them. Even transformed, he can't win. What the hell is this planet? One Namekian is able to sneak around Raditz, cutting his tail clean off. And everyone watches as he detransforms. Kakarot points a single finger at Raditz as he gets smaller and smaller, charging a beam ready to kill him. He's threatening this peaceful planet, and he wants this man to leave. He doesn't even know why this guy is attacking them. Kakarot's a Saiyan too, doesn't he know that? If anything, he's working to avenge the Saiyans, why is a Saiyan trying to attack them? But Raditz tells Kakarot he has it all wrong. He asks him, why kill his own brother? Wait, brother? This comes as a shock to everyone, including Kakarot himself. Somehow there was another Saiyan survivor out there, and it was his own brother of all things. That explains why the key felt familiar somehow. It felt familiar to his own. Raditz begins to explain why he's here. Originally, he wanted to recruit Kakarot. He wanted Kakarot as part of his group. There's two other Saiyans around as well. There's Prince Vegeta IV, who is the son of King Vegeta, and then Nappa. And Kakarot immediately recognized the name Vegeta. It's the name of the planet, after all. And I mean, his name is Prince Vegeta, so this must be important. And if these Saiyans all survived, they must be pretty strong. Apparently, they wanted to defeat some guy named Frieza. And for some reason, that name sounds familiar to Kakarot, too. Of course, he has heard it before from the Namekians. But more so, he feels like he knows it from before, when his parents sent him away. Did his father mention it or something? He tries racking his brain, but he can't tell. But even if they are trying to defeat this Frieza guy, Kakarot doesn't really want to join these Saiyans. From what he knows, Frieza's really strong. That would be death. But also, he's not like the Saiyans. Just look at what Raditz just did. He almost killed all those Namekians and Kakarot, just to get his way. Had they not been stronger than him, who knows? He could have killed dozens of people. Kakarot is a peaceful warrior. He's here to protect Namek as well as other planets like Namek, including Earth. The Saiyans are vicious warriors, and even if they are trying to defeat Frieza, which seems unrealistic right now, he doesn't really want to join them. That's not who he is. But Raditz says Kakarot doesn't understand. They need to kill Frieza no matter what. Even if he isn't like the Saiyans, who cares? And Kakarot asks Raditz, does he think Frieza's maybe the reason that planet Vegeta was destroyed? The reason all those Saiyans, including their parents, are dead. The reason that these two were separated for so many years. And Raditz is taken aback by this. Well, honestly, he doesn't know. He's been told that a meteor destroyed the planet, but obviously that sounds kind of fishy. He, Vegeta, and Nappa have always thought that Frieza did it. They never had any definitive proof, but it's always been in the back of their minds. This isn't a definitive answer for Kakarot, but the fact that even these three suspect it makes him realize. It might have actually been Frieza that caused it. It was like he was suspecting before there was someone responsible for destroying the planet, so he knows exactly who he has to kill to get vengeance from. But still, it's completely unrealistic right now. He even gets more info from Raditz about Frieza's strength. And Kakarot's kind of reluctant, but he says he might join them. Although there is kind of an issue. Raditz doesn't have a scouter anymore and he doesn't even have a space pod. He has no way of contacting Vegeta and Nappa. But it should be fine. They'll probably be here within a few months. I mean, they might have thought that Raditz died here after all. So they'll come back for him, hopefully. And in the meantime, Raditz can stay here and help train Kakarot. Or at least show him more of his Saiyan side. Obviously, Raditz is way weaker than Kakarot right now, so training him won't really do too much. If anything, it'll be the other way around. But the sentiment is there, at least. Raditz begins getting to know his brother more and more, and it seems that even though Kakarot does want to join them in this goal, it won't be permanent. He's going to return to Namek and stay here. This is where he belongs. And Raditz can respect that. At least he's found his brother, and it will be a temporary alliance, and they'll defeat Frieza, hopefully. With all this training, the two of them grow a lot stronger. Obviously, Kakarot was already on a great path, but now, Raditz has more training. And even though the Namekians are wary of him at first, things should be okay. It takes a few months before anything happens, and let's say after some training, Kakarot gets to a level of about 15,000, with Raditz going all the way up to where Kakarot was at its 6,000. And after these few months pass, they eventually do sense two powers coming to Namek. Raditz never knew how to sense Ki before, which he just learned on Namek, so he can't actually tell who these two are, but it must be Vegeta and Nappa. And as they get closer, Kakarot senses the maliciousness within them, but he can also tell that it feels like a Saiyan's Ki. It has to be them. The two land on the planet, unsure of where to go. On their scouters they see a bunch of high power levels, but they're then met by two people, Raditz and Kakarot. They ask Raditz where the hell he's been, and he said his pod got destroyed, as well as his scouter, that's why he hasn't contacted them. And all Vegeta and Nappa are a little glad to see that Raditz and Kakarot are here, that's not the main goal. Before, when Raditz landed on the planet, they heard about the wish orbs. It's great that Raditz didn't die and they have an extra team member it seems. But first, they ask Kakarot, where are the wish orbs? Kakarot's confused to hear this. Wait, why do they know about them, and is that why they're here? And Vegeta tells him, 
Yeah, if they're gonna defeat Frieza, they're gonna need the Wish Orbs. He's gonna wish for immortality. Raditz wasn't even aware of this. These two seem really casual about it, like the only reason they came here is for the Wish Orbs. And Kakarot says he's not gonna let them use the Dragon Balls. They can't just use it for that. He can't even trust them. He literally just met Vegeta. He's not gonna let him become immortal. The two of them go back and forth, and an argument begins, which eventually leads to Vegeta threatening Kakarot. He tells Kakarot he's an idiot. There's no way they're gonna defeat Frieza without the Wish Orbs. He holds out a hand with the charge blast in it. But Kakarot doesn't back down. He's not gonna be strong-armed into showing them the Dragon Balls. And they ask Raditz too. Come on, convince his brother. But Raditz actually takes Kakarot's side on this one. Even though he's only known Kakarot for a few months, the two of them have a pretty nice bond, compared to Vegeta and Nappa that always treated Raditz like a doormat. But mostly this is because it seemed like they forgot about him. It's like they only came here for the Dragon Balls. They didn't even care to see him alive. And actually scolded him for it. Angered, Vegeta launches the blast at Kakarot, and he simply swats it away. Suddenly, Kakarot disappears behind the two of them. His first attack is a pretty strategic one. He rips off both Vegeta and Nappa's tails. They shout and turn back at Kakarot angrily. What the hell is he doing? Vegeta gets a read on his scouter. He thought Kakarot was a lot weaker, but it seems like he was suppressing his power. Now it's at 15,000. That's close to where Vegeta is in terms of power, but still, the prince is stronger. He'll win this. This argument turns into a full-on fight. Nappa fights Raditz, while Kakarot takes on Vegeta. Nappa's ready to beat up Raditz. He's always been the weakling of the group, and this shouldn't be too hard, but Raditz is easily able to put Nappa in his place. He's been waiting for this for a long time. Finally, he gets to show them that he's not a weakling, and Nappa surprises he's then beaten up by Raditz, pretty easily in fact. As for Kakarot, the fight is definitely a lot closer. Vegeta is stronger by Kakarot, but not by a massive margin, but it's still significant enough to make a difference. Although Kakarot is still able to hold off Vegeta pretty easily, they are close in strength after all. And just as quickly as Raditz defeats Nappa, he goes over to help his brother. Originally, these two were going to handle the Saiyans alone, thinking that this would be a peaceful encounter. But other Namekians eventually joined the fight, sensing that fighting is going on. They didn't expect this after all. And they knew those Saiyans were bad news. It seems like Raditz is actually on Kakarot's side though, which is kind of weird. They didn't expect him to side with him. But still, these two are a problem and they need to get rid of these Saiyans. As Raditz and Kakarot are trying to fight Vegeta, Nail then flies in, and with one single punch, he knocks the wind out of Vegeta, and he's thrown into a mountain nearby. The mountain cracks and collapses on top of Vegeta, and Raditz and Kakarot look on in awe. They knew Nail was strong, but Kakarot's never seen this power used from Nail. He's never had to use that much before. With one single casual attack, he took down Vegeta. Vegeta and Nappa don't even try and fight again. They're too beaten up right now, and Nappa's already called their space pots. They're gonna be stubborn about it. If they can't get the Dragon Balls, they'll just do it themselves. These two could stand Namek alone. They'll find another way to defeat Frieza. Those two are idiots. They think training on this peaceful planet will help them defeat Frieza. How stupid. They're pretty pissed with Raditz too, and obviously they're not going to take him along with them. Raditz doesn't even want to go anyways. Even if he's not going to stay here permanently, he's still welcome on Namek at least. Well, that was a complete bust. They thought they would just join the Saiyans and this would be nice, but it seems like things aren't going their way. And as for the two Saiyans, they have other plans in mind. If Dragon Balls actually do exist, they could probably find them somewhere else. There has to be other plans with Namekians on them after all. They've heard rumors about that. So even if they can't get the Dragon Balls here, maybe other places have it. Research begins for them. But they're not the only people researching. Frieza's also gotten wind of the Dragon Balls. After their defeat against Kakarot and Raditz, Nappa and Vegeta depart of Namek, returning back to the Frieza Force base. They go there to get healed too. They're not in completely terrible shape, but they're still pretty badly beaten. And they will get a bit stronger from this, but it won't be enough. They know that they need to get a lot stronger if they ever want to defeat those two. But that's not their main goal right now. They want to look for more Dragon Balls. Namek confirmed that they do exist, and they gotta keep this under wraps. They can't let Frieza or anyone else find out. And their target has shifted away from Namek. Sure, they could train a bit, and then go back to see if they're strong enough to actually get the Dragon Balls then. But that might not work. Who knows? Kakarot and Raditz might get really strong within that time frame. And whatever training they do right now might not be enough. So instead, they're going to search around the universe, trying to find other planets with wish orbs. There's got to be other places that Namekians live on. They know Namekians have space travel. So the two of them begin looking into this, trying to find any other planets that they can. Looking to see if Namekians exist on any of them. And as soon as they're fully healed, the two of them immediately leave. Nappa asks where they're going, and Vegeta says they're going to go train somewhere else. They're going to defect from the Frieza Force right now. Even if they don't know where they're going yet, it's fine. They got to leave the Frieza Force. The two of them are able to steal a ship and leave. And of course, this does cause some disarray within the Frieza Force itself. Frieza heard of them going to Namek and then coming back very injured. That already did make him pretty suspicious, but then the two of them just left and defected, and no one could find where they're going. 
This does catch his attention. Of course, he doesn't care if they leave, but he's more interested in why. What happened that caused them to do all this, and why did they get so injured? Namek is supposed to be a peaceful place, right? Sure, there might be some strong warriors there, but how are they that strong? And what are they exactly protecting? Why did Vegeta and Nappa go there in the first place? Something doesn't sound right here. He's suspicious that maybe Saiyans or Dragon Balls are involved. It's gotta be one of those two. Why would they go to this planet? Little does he know it's both. Not only does another Saiyan live there, but Dragon Balls do exist there. He's not too sure and has no confirmation yet, so he's gonna send some scouts by Namek to see what's going on. This isn't too much cause for concern yet, but it's just enough to pique his attention. He does wanna see what's going on. Meanwhile, Raditz does stay on Namek. He doesn't really have anywhere else to go, and he decides he's actually gonna train here for a bit. Kakarot already knows he's not planning to stay permanently, but he convinced Raditz to actually stay for a bit longer just so he can get stronger. But Raditz tells him that they might be in trouble. Why? Well, if Vegeta and Nappa came here, that's definitely gonna put them on Frieza's radar. It doesn't matter if Vegeta and Nappa keep quiet. The Frieza Force is probably gonna figure something out. Why would Vegeta, Nappa, and Raditz all head here? Especially with only two of them heading back. He doesn't think Vegeta and Nappa would actually tell Frieza what's going on here. Vegeta might be working against them, but he's also working against Frieza. He wouldn't willingly tell Frieza about the Dragon Balls. If anything, Frieza's gonna find out by being suspicious. It's just what we discussed before, and Raditz suspects this to be the case. Nail says that makes sense. That definitely does check out and seems like something that would happen, so they probably should be a bit cautious. And Kakarot's not too sure what to do. Of course, they could just keep training and get stronger, but is that gonna really be enough? Especially since Frieza has a whole army. He doesn't know how strong Frieza is right now, and sure, maybe he can get strong enough to actually fight him, but that's a long way off. So what are they supposed to do now? Well, that actually gives Raditz an idea. One of the big issues is that Frieza has a strong army, so why not let Namek have a strong army too? An army of Namekians? That's unheard of. Sure, they have warriors and all, but they never made an organized militia or anything. And Raditz says that this might be necessary. If they're gonna be facing the Frieza force, how else are they supposed to defend themselves? Sure, they got a few strong Namekian warriors, they have Nail and Kakarot, but is that gonna be enough? Especially with Kakarot and Nail having to focus on Frieza since they're the two strongest. Raditz says he would join too, but he's gonna be leaving here eventually. He can't stay here forever to help them. He doesn't wanna be involved in this pointless war anyways. But for the time being, he could at least help them organize an army. While they train him, he'll help them organize. And that might actually work. But while we're on the topic of Raditz, what's he gonna do after all of this? He's obviously defected from the Frieza Force by now, and he just wants to venture out into space on his own. He'll find his place somewhere. He doesn't know exactly what he's gonna do yet, but he'll find something. As a saying, he wants to fight, but not as a slave to Frieza, and even though he's grateful for what the Namekians did to him, he's not gonna stay here and die against Frieza. He doesn't even know if they could win exactly, and it's not that he's running away, it's just he realizes that it might be pointless. And Kakarot's fine with it. Raditz was never really supposed to be here anyways, and maybe it would be better if he goes off on his own. At least he gets revived if anything bad happens here, but Kakarot is obviously gonna stay. And Raditz tells him to sue himself, but Kakarot's welcome to come see him anytime, as long as he could find his brother. So, some time passes. The Namekians begin growing a lot stronger, they train with Kakarot, Nail, and Raditz, and Raditz gets a lot stronger too before he heads out. But the biggest help from him was the fact that he helped organize an army. They started getting all these Namekian warriors together, whipping them into shape. They're strong, sure, but they could make them stronger. And thanks to Raditz's suggestion, as well as the threat of the Frieza Force, more Namekians are born. Not even just warrior Namekians, more from each clan in general. Namek's population begins booming. It could definitely support all these people there. At first, they liked being this small, community-driven race, but Namek's faced tragedy before and obviously they're gonna wanna avoid that again, so maybe it's for the best that they make more Namekians. New villages pop up around the planet. There's more farms, more Namekians from each clan. It's insane. Kakarot's never seen the planet grow like this. Of course, he's only been here for about 20 years, but it's always been kinda stagnant, and Nail says the same thing. He's been here much longer. He and Guru have never seen anything like it, but this is great. They even start building more training facilities, basically schools for all these Namekians that are being born. The best part is, it doesn't take long for these Namekians to grow up, some were born long before, so there's already more warriors than there was originally. But in a few years, there'll be even more. They'll be fully grown by that time. And speaking of time, the Namekians actually construct a new place that'll help them a lot with training. If Kami and Dende had the ability to do this, it's only natural that another Namekian could probably build a room of spirit in time. This one's a little bit different from the one on Earth. Right now, it's only three months of training within a day. But this is still huge, and they're gonna try and upgrade it as more time passes. This was actually thanks to the help of Mori, he remembered Kami mentioned something like this when they visited before, and he actually did contact Kami while building this. Apparently things on Earth have been going well too, but we'll be saving more of Earth for the next few parts. For now, we're only focusing on Namek. Let's cover some power levels right now too. Kakarot's at 600,000, a huge boost from where he was before. He's even surpassed Nail who's at 500,000. And a lot of the other warrior Namekians got stronger too, with powers ranging from 10k to 100k. 
And there's one very important warrior raising through the ranks really quickly. He's getting very strong, and is a higher up Namekian warrior with a power level of about 150k. This Namekian was born a few years back, and has a lot of motivation to grow strong, much more than any other warrior Namekians that they've seen before, and he acts kind of different from the others. But as far as Kakarot and Nail could tell, he's one of the best soldiers. This soldier is named Slug, but we'll be seeing more of him later on. Nail's incredibly impressed with the army, and also very impressed that Kakarot finally surpassed him. He knew it would happen eventually, and he's proud of his student and adopted son. This is a new era of Namek's history that they're witnessing in the making, and all of it started because a Saiyan landed here long ago. It's kind of incredible when they think about it, and he can tell something is on Kakarot's mind, and Kakarot says that he's been reading something. He's been studying a bit, which he's done in the past, but this time he's been trying to look for new ways to get power for himself. The Namekian Book of Legends is a big help, and he even consulted Guru a bit too. Apparently there's a lot about Saiyans that he doesn't know about, specifically some legend of a Super Saiyan. It's a power that's very interesting to him. He doesn't know if it's some power he can access or if it's a person, and he wants to figure it out. He's not too sure about it yet, but he's going to keep looking. And Nail gives him insight on it too. Maybe it is a power, maybe it's something Kakarot can access somehow. But there's only one way for him to learn about it. He needs to keep training. Kakarot chuckles. He'll figure out a way to get this power one way or another. He just has to keep doing what he's been doing so far. And amidst their training, Namek gets some surprise visitors too, and they try and enter undercover. It's two people, Zarbon and the Dorian, but they pretend to be regular travelers. They don't have their scouters or their armor on. They want to be as unsuspecting as possible. Dodori even suggested that they wear fake mustaches. But Zarbon said that would be a little bit too obvious. The two arrive on the planet, and they're trying to be pretty casual about it. They act like they're lost, trying to get info about the people here, and asking if the rumors of Dragon Balls are true. They also heard that there was some Saiyan here. They wanted to see him too. The Namekians all go along with it, and they even lead the two of them to Kakarot. Zarbon and Dodoria are led into an open area, and Kakarot descends down in front of them. Dodoria then reaches in his pocket for a scouter, and as soon as he pulls it out, it gets destroyed by a beam from his side. They look around them. They're surrounded by Namekians, and Kakarot laughs. Do these two really think they're stupid? They could sense their evil key from a mile away. Even without their armor or scouters or Frieza Force ships, they knew these were Frieza Force members. That malicious key was a dead giveaway, but Kakarot says he might have some use for them. He wants some info. Dodoria tries to attack one of the Namekians nearby, launching a powerful beam, which is met by an even more powerful beam, and it's completely eradicated by that one Namekian. And Zarbon just looks on in awe. Did a Namekian just kill him? Are they actually that strong? Angrily, he turns over to Kakarot, and Kakarot asks again. He tells Zarbon there's no escape. He saw what happened to his comrade just now, and Kakarot says that could happen to him just as easily. And Zarbon says why they're here, but says it's pointless. If they die, Frieza will come regardless, whether or not they get the information back to him. If they don't return to the Frieza Force, they're going to know something went down here, and definitely are going to show up afterwards. And Kakarot says they knew that. They knew that either way, the Frieza Force was going to find out about this. Whether those two returned alive, or they died here. Zarbon's getting angry too. Not only did Dodoria just die, but these guys are being so cocky around him. He'll put them in their place. He transforms, going into his monster form. And he powers up. The Namekians don't even do anything, they just watch on, as does Kakarot. Zarbon then launches over to Kakarot, with a powerful attack charged in one of his hands too. And Kakarot's completely unfazed. He simply sticks out one hand, and in one swift motion, it pierces right through Zarbon's chest. He flings Zarbon to the side, and Zarbon's on the ground barely alive. Kakarot swats the blood off his hand, and he looks over at Zarbon. He simply tells him they'll stop Frieza. He doesn't care how strong he is, but he does have one more question for Zarbon, just for confirmation. Was Frieza responsible for destroying planet Vegeta? This actually kind of surprises Zarbon, and weakly he chuckles, coughing up blood too. So, it appears these Saiyans are smarter than they thought. They always took them for stupid apes, but this one was right in his assumption that Frieza destroyed their planet. Kakarot barely reacts, just as he thought. He launches two beams from his eyes, and the ground in front of him explodes as Zarbon is killed. They now know that Frieza is responsible for this, and with these two soldiers dead, Kakarot expects more to show up soon. He doesn't know if Frieza will show up right away, but they know to at least expect the army sometime soon. He turns to the Namekians, spread the word. It's time to prepare. Planet Namek just declared war against the Frieza force, in an act of self-defense. They still have a bit of time in them. They know they're going to have at least a few days or even a few weeks before the Frieza force arrive, and that room of spirit and time is really going to help. The army uses it a lot more. They're focused on getting their weakest soldiers stronger now. Even though they have a few strong people like Kakarot, Nail, Slug, and some other warriors, they want everyone to be strong. And the great thing is, since Namekians only need water, there's no limit to how many people can go in the room of spirit and time. On Earth, the way it works is anyone can go in, but there's only enough food for two people for one year. 
But since the Mechians don't need food, this isn't a worry. They could fit as many people there as they want, just as long as there's enough water. And they've got a big supply going in there. Kakarot and Nail even cycle in and out of there. And as time passes, they watch as the warriors go stronger and stronger. Some of them even are able to grow up by using the Room of Spirit in time. Spending a few days in there means they come out fully grown, ready to defend their plan. Nail and Guru are incredibly surprised that it turned out this way. He never expected this peaceful planet to need an army, but this will help them prosper. An army of good soldiers defending Namek, and maybe even eventually they could help the universe out. With all this manpower, imagine the good they could do. And I mean, just look at it. All these Namekians, they're such pure warriors. They're so good and righteous. Well, at least most of them. Unbeknownst to Nail and Kakarot, there may be an impure soul amongst that bunch. Eventually, some Frieza Force soldiers arrive, and they're easily dispatched. It actually takes no effort. And the Namekians even laugh it off. They were really weak. But Kakarot says not to let their guard down. There's definitely more strong soldiers with the Frieza Force. It's not just these guys. More and more ships come in, and a lot of them are filled with weak soldiers, but eventually the Ginyu Force even comes in. And the Frieza soldiers are incredibly confident. They tell the Namekians it's over for them. With the Ginyu Force here, there's no way they're gonna lose. And the Ginyu Force actually does make some progress. The Namekians have a bit of trouble holding them off. Not really because of their strength, but mainly because of their abilities. And luckily, they figure out a way to counter Ginyu's ability right away. He tries to body change with one of the warrior Namekians. And it almost works, but just as the body change is about to land, an explosion occurs that knocks Goldo right in front of the Namekian, and Ginyu swaps bodies with one of his own soldiers. They immediately try and switch back, and this lets the Namekians know their strategy. Although Goldo's power is a bit harder to counter, but three strong warriors appear, plowing through all the Frieza Force soldiers. First Nail shows up, then Kakarot, and then Slug. The three split up. Kakarot decides to take on Jason Birder, while Nail tries to take on Raccoon and Goldo, and Slug tries to take on Ginyu. Even with their combined teamwork, Jace and Birda are no match for Kakarot. And even though Goldo's time abilities are annoying, Nail is just so powerful that it barely even matters. Nail launches over towards him and Goldo's only barely able to stop time. And quickly he moves out of the way, but just as he unfreezes time, Nail kicks off at the ground, launching back over to where Goldo just ran to. Immediately killing him, and then with another attack, killing Raccoon. And as for Ginyu, he makes quick work of Slug. And Ginyu's amazed by his power. He even offers to recruit Slug, seeing his potential. But Slug declines, he's not going to join the Frieza Force. And Ginyu tells him it's a shame, that's such a waste of power going to Namek, only for it to die against Frieza. But maybe Ginyu can make better use of his body. He tries to swap bodies with Slug, but just as Ginyu launches the body change, Slug quickly moves out of the way, then appearing behind Ginyu. He tells Ginyu not to mock him, and with one brutal attack, he kills Ginyu. He'll only go stronger from here on out, he's not weak at all. And with the Ginyu Force dead and the Frieza Force being quickly eliminated, it seems Frieza has no other choice. One final ship lands on the planet, and the person to step off is Frieza himself. All the Namekians arrive over at the ship, with Kakarot getting there too. Frieza steps off and makes eye contact with his Saiyan. Something's familiar about him. Frieza smirks. He pulls out a scatter, trying to figure out Kakarot's power level. It's pretty weak, and he finally pieces it together. He looks just like the Saiyan that rebelled against him a while ago. And even though he may be stronger than the Saiyan, it still seems he's weak. His power is only a measly 40,000. How funny. Kakarot then powers up. Frieza's scouter explodes. And Frieza receives a quick chop to the back of the neck. Frieza stumbles forward, turning around to see Kakarot there. As Frieza recollects himself, the two stare each other down again. So as we left off last time, Frieza was already on the ropes. Against Kakarot, it seems like he already is outmatched. He can't play around anymore. He goes right into his final form, ready to battle. Just to try and terrify the Namekian army, he tells them, He's only at half his power right now, but this should be more than enough. And this is no bluff. In his final form right now, he's just showcasing 50% of his power. Thankfully, he hasn't fought much yet, so it's not like he's expended a lot of energy already. But he did take a couple of powerful attacks from Kakarot, so it's not like he's at perfect health. As Frieza reveals this final form, the rest of the Namekians look on. Kakarot then looks behind him. More and more Namekians are joining him. The entire army of Namek is by his side, with even Nail and Slug joining not too long after. Dozens of Namekians stare down Frieza, with Kakarot right up front. Frieza looks around confused. Wait, his army? Why aren't they fighting them? Did they kill everyone? Yeah, all of Frieza's army has been eradicated. Even the Ginyu Force? Even the Ginyu Force. The regular soldiers are one thing, but Frieza's surprised. They even killed the Ginyu Force. And they don't seem too injured either. They're that powerful, strong enough to defeat Ginyu and his entire crew. Kakarot tells Frieza he has one last chance to leave. Normally, he wouldn't feel this merciful towards Frieza, but he already humiliated him. Frieza's entire army is destroyed, and he already did give Frieza a good beating. Frieza laughs in response to this. They're mocking him. They're that confident. They think they can beat him. 
He's not going to retreat. If anything, they should be the one to retreat. He tells them they have no idea what they're up against. He's way stronger than all of them, even combined. Suddenly, more Namekians appear. With a few seemingly even warping in, they appear right in front of Frieza's eyes. And quickly, they jump around, placing their hands on other Namekians and Kakarot. Those are the non-warrior Namekians. They didn't just beef up the physical strength of the warrior Namekians. The other Namekians have been practicing magic too. Amongst all the abilities they learned includes faster healing and being able to teleport short distances. These healer Namekians warp around, healing up the rest of the army. They're back to full health. The last person healed is Kakarot. He feels a burst of energy. Not only is his ki restored and his health restored, but also he got a boost in power. It's very slight, but it's still there. The ground begins rumbling. The battle's about to begin. Frieza wonders what's happening, but everyone hears a deep roar. To Kakarot's side, one of the Namekians grows huge. Slug turned into his giant form. It makes him a bigger target and doesn't increase his key too much, but this will help. And it definitely is intimidating for Frieza because after he transforms, the other Namekians follow, including Nail. Kakarot's invigorated by this. He may as well join them. Thanks to some teachings from Raditz, he actually can now. His tail grew back from healing long ago. And in his hands, he creates an artificial move, throwing it way up in the sky. Frieza isn't too intimidated, but he looks on in awe as all the Namekians transform, with Grade 8 Kakarot right at the front. Kakarot shouts, with the Namekians following. The battle begins. Let's actually cover everyone's powers right now, because believe it or not, the Namekian army is incredibly powerful. Frieza at 50% is around 60 million, but since he's a bit injured, let's say he's more around 50, just to help out our heroes. In his Grade 8 form, Kakarot's at 40 million. After all that training in the Time Chamber, and the Zenkais he's received in this battle and other ones, his base power is around 4 million. Multiply that by 10 with Grade 8, and it's 40, obviously. Nail's grown a lot stronger too, with a power of 2 million. And even though he's pretty far behind Nail, Slug is still the third strongest of them. And the strongest Namekian outside of Nail, he's at 500k. And with the collective might of the Namekian army, let's place them at around 20 million, excluding Slug and Nail. The tricky thing is though, they might have too many people for this fight. Even though their collective power does outmatch Frieza's, it's spread amongst dozens and dozens of soldiers. And at a certain point, it's hard for so many people to fight together. And again, Power levels aren't everything either, but it still is important to note that. The good thing for Frieza is he has a bunch of large targets too, but he quickly realizes that Kakarot's one of the main issues for him. Kakarot's so close to him in terms of power as a grade 8, and even though he is a larger target and still weaker than Frieza, it's not going to be pretty for Frieza. He's stampeded by giant Namekians and Kakarot. The Namekians are mainly there as a distraction though. They're mainly trying to create openings for Kakarot and Nail, and they know that with too many of them together, coordinating an attack on one normal sized person is too hard. And that's why they're doing it like this. And this is actually working out pretty well. They're able to get a lot of hits in on Frieza. Powerful blasts from Nail and Kakarot actually do injure him a bit. And Frieza's so overwhelmed surrounded by so many Namekians. Even when he tries to kill them, it's hard. Sure, maybe a few death beams here and there will hit some of them. But with Namekian healers being able to teleport in, this is a great strategy. Those Namekians won't even die. And a lot of them have built up regeneration to the point where they can regenerate from small injuries like that. As long as the attacks don't hit any vitals. A lot of Namekians are being wounded, but it doesn't even matter in the end. They're getting restored to full health and still fight. Frieza realizes he needs to attack the healers, but this isn't going to work either. The healers can teleport. Whenever he tries to attack them, they're able to get out of the way. There's even one there that seems weaker, a child named Dende. You would think this would be an easy target for Frieza, but also consider the fact that he has so many Namekians fighting him at once. If the healers can't teleport away in time, they're protected by the warriors. And if Frieza tries to attack the warriors, well, he's just distracted by other ones. He has so many people around him that it's hard. He even tries to blow up the planet at one point, jumping far up in the air and charging a blast. He throws it right down at the planet, but Kakarot gets under it, opening his mouth, launching a beam in response. This flings the attack right back towards Frieza. He tries to deflect it, but is hit by his own attack and Kakarot's. Injuring himself even more, he's getting sloppy, and he's getting angry. Frieza's overwhelmed. He needs 100% power. And thankfully, he has another ally on the way. They may have eradicated a lot of the Frieza force, but there's still one powerful person left that he hasn't called in. One that he's been waiting on, and now is the perfect time. The Namekians are too distracted by Frieza to even notice. Another ship lands nearby. Frieza powers up to 100%, and the ship catches Frieza's attention. He knows exactly who it is. From behind the Namekians, another blast flies past them. Another person has shown up. He doesn't seem as strong as Frieza now, but he's still really powerful, more powerful than any of the other people they face besides Frieza. And also, he looks pretty similar to Frieza. This is his father. King Cold has arrived. He even mocks Frieza, joking about how he wasn't able to handle this himself. Please, these Namekians and that one Saiyan were trouble for him? Frieza tells King Cold to shut up, just help him slaughter all these people. King Cold tells him to relax, he was just making fun. And now the tides are turning, 
With Frieza at his full power and a new ally arriving for him, they get the advantage. Namekians begin getting injured, at a rate that even exceeds the healer's help. They won't retreat yet. Even though they might die here, they're not going to back down. And with all this help now, Frieza realizes he doesn't need to focus on all these Namekians. He's only going to focus on the top three strongest. He's already figured out who they are. Kakarot, that's Saiyan, and two of the Namekians, Nail and Slug. He'll take them down first, and then he could slaughter the army easily. He glares over at Nail. That'll be his first target. He lifts up a single finger. He launches a death beam. Nail tries to move out of the way quickly, but he's not quick enough. It takes off one of his arms. He regenerates it, but he gets hit by another death beam, and another, and another. Frieza launches a barrage of beams. Piercing holds a Nail faster than he could regenerate. Nail tries fighting back, but he's met by more and more blasts. Slug and Kakarot are preoccupied with Cold, but Kakarot looks over seeing this. As he's being attacked more and more, in one hand, Nail begins charging an attack. He'll put all his energy into it. He thinks he might die here, so he might as well use everything he's got. Weakly he stands, but he places out his hand in front of him. Frieza even laughs a bit. How pathetic. Nail shouts, launching one last attack. It hits Frieza dead on, and Frieza guards against it. After the blast dissipates, Frieza's standing there, still in good condition. How sad. That was his last attack. Nail shrinks back down to normal size, collapsing on the ground. Angrily, Kakarot rushes over towards Frieza, but then feels a sharp pain in his tail. King Cold slices it off, and Kakarot then detransforms, going back into his normal state. He's on the ground, and he makes his way towards Nail, but Frieza then jumps down on top of him, kicking Kakarot right into the dirt. Kakarot tries to get Frieza off of him, but he's too strong. King Cold is single-handedly holding off the rest of the Namekians. Frieza will deal with the Saiyan himself. Kakarot looks over at Nail, and Nail turns over to him. He weakly smiles. He tells Kakarot it's okay. As long as he's still alive, Namek will be fine. Just as he's always known, Kakarot will be the one to save this planet. Kakarot will defeat Frieza. He chuckles. Maybe he'll even be the Super Saiyan. Frieza steps down on Kakarot again, hurting him once more. The ground cracks, and Kakarot watches as Nail's life drains away. Slowly but surely, his key completely dissipates. Nail has died right in front of him. Frieza mocks Kakarot. He tells him not to cry. He'll join his friends soon enough. He stomps down on Kakarot again, and again. The crater in the ground grows deeper and deeper. He stomps on Kakarot one more time, but this time Frieza feels resistance. There's a large gust of wind. It even distracts the other Namekians on King Cold. Frieza's knocked back, and slowly, Kakarot stands up. He's battered and beaten, but he's been pushed to his limit. Another gust of wind is generated, and Kakarot begins glowing. Then in a split second, his hair stands up. It turns golden, and he's surrounded by an equally brilliant aura. Nail is right. Kakarot will defend this planet. As long as he's around, Frieza and Cold will die. And just like Nail said, he has become the Super Saiyan. Frieza and Cold's smug expressions are wiped away. They look over at Kakarot in disbelief. They feel like they know what this is, but they don't want to admit it. It's something they've always feared, something that they try to prevent. The other Namekians are just as amazed. What they're witnessing is the first Super Saiyan they've ever seen. Kakarot slowly turns around, with tears in his eyes. Angrily and out of fear, Cold and Frieza begin launching beams at Kakarot together. They do nothing, so they try and speed it up speeding up more and more with each blast. Dozens of beams hit Kakarot every second, but they do nothing. He takes a step towards them, and they flinch. He takes another step, and then disappears. They don't know where he went, but Frieza then looks over at King Cold. Kakarot's standing right behind him, and with a single blast, King Cold is completely eradicated. Kakarot disappears again, appearing in front of Frieza. Before Frieza even has time to turn around, he's punched right in the gut. Kakarot's elbow then meets his head, forcing Frieza down on the ground. He picks Frieza up by his head, staring him down. He's not going to drag this out. They've already lost one life, and he can't afford to lose others. He's already embarrassed Frieza, and if Frieza dies now, Kakarot will be content. He doesn't need to draw out his revenge. He's already gone. He tells Frieza he hopes he remembers this in hell. His last vision in the living world will be Kakarot, the Super Saiyan that Frieza always feared. One of the last few survivors of a race that Frieza destroyed. The person that defeated his entire army, and Frieza himself. He powers up. His aura gets even larger. The entire area shakes, even knocking back some of the Namekians. Using the same attack that Nail used, Kakarot kills Frieza in one blow. Nothing is left of him, just like King Cold. Without saying a word, Kakarot then powers down. He got victory, he got revenge, and Namek's okay. But they lost Nail, his teacher, his father figure, his friend. Slug tells Kakarot that he can't be so sad about it. I mean, they have Purunga, they could always ask him to bring Nail back. But Kakarot tells Slug that won't work. He didn't want to reveal this during battle, but he and Nail knew that Guru was already close to death. And during the battle, Kakarot sends Guru's energy fade away. And one of the healers even confirmed this too. They tried to save him, but the stress of this battle was too much. His heart gave out and he died. Not only did Nail die, but Guru died too. And they're not coming back. They don't have Paranga right now. 
the Namekians tell Kakarot that his sacrifice wasn't in vain. Without Nail, they wouldn't all be alive right now. His training and guidance really helped, and they tell Kakarot not to let it weigh down on him. This leaves Namek in an odd place right now. They don't have a Guardian, and they don't have Dragon Balls. Not having Dragon Balls is fine, it's not like they have any use for them right now besides reviving Nail. Their planet has been protected, and out of the people going for the Dragon Balls, one is dead, and the other two are Saiyans that are too weak to even do anything right now. Mori has made the new Grand Elder, but it's going to take some time before they have any Dragon Balls, and it's not like this is an instant process either. In a way, Namek's in a little bit of disarray right now, and with so many Namekians here, it makes things a bit more complicated. But Slug sees this as an opportunity. He tells the Namekians, maybe he could be their new ruler, even being their new Grand Elder. Mori's already been chosen for it, and they'd rather have him since he's more experienced. But Slug says he's the strongest Namekian right now. If he's made Elder, Perunga will be incredibly powerful once he makes him and they'll have an elder that can defend himself. Even though he's not really an elder, he's only a few years old. But Kakarot knows he's up to something. It's not that he wants to be elder, he wants to have influence over Namek. He pulls Slug aside, asking him what he really wants. And of course, Slug's not gonna just reveal it. But Kakarot knows he's trying to lead Namek into a new direction, one that Kakarot doesn't like. Unlike the other Namekians, Slug isn't really a pacifist. If anything, he's more like the Saiyans that Kakarot's met before, in a bad way, actually. He tells Slug it would be better if Mori's just made elder. He's been proven to be a good leader, and it only makes sense to make him that anyways, not a warrior like Slug. Slug tries to convince Kakarot, and eventually this turns into an argument. This isn't some small thing, and he wonders why Slug is so set on it. And with Kakarot in such a volatile state right now, this only makes the argument expand even more. Slug tells Kakarot to stop being so foolish. If they had leadership like him a while ago, this would have never happened. The Namekians would have already been strong enough to defeat Frieza. Nail would still be alive. Sure, they trained a few months before him, but if they started even earlier, Namek would have been undefeatable. But Kakarot tells them they only did that out of necessity. Namek's a peaceful planet. They never plan on creating this giant army anyways. And Kakarot can sense something weird in Slug. There's a slight maliciousness. Out of anger, Slug then leaves. Fine. Kakarot can suit himself. Namek will be lost without powerful leadership like Slug. He'll get stronger on his own. He'll prove to them that they need him. Much to the surprise of everyone else, they watch as Slug leaves. Kakarot still feels uneasy about all this. Why is he acting like that? He'll worry about that later. It's not like he's strong enough now to even be a concern, if he does try and turn on them. If anything, this is more reason to get the Dragon Balls. And Kakarot has an idea already. He knows exactly where to go for Dragon Balls. Namek wasn't the only place with them. There still is another set on Earth. All he needs to do is go there. And he'll head there alone. The rest of the Namekians can help fix this planet up again, and get a new set of governance going. They need to keep it as it was before. A simple set of villages, and no monarch like Slug wanted. Kakarot boards a ship, heading towards Earth. And even though he expects it to be peaceful, he might run into some trouble on the way, and maybe some familiar enemies. Kakarot departs Namek, heading towards Earth. He knows there's Dragon Balls there, and he could rely on the help of the humans in Khan. He also has always wanted to see this planet. It would be nice to visit regardless. He hasn't really left Namek at all. Getting a better view of the universe would be pretty nice. A great change of pace from his current life. He's not too concerned, but while he's gone, he just hopes whatever Slug is up to doesn't affect Namek. He doesn't know what Slug is planning or when he plans to even come back, if at all. But as long as nothing happens while he's gone on Earth, he'll be able to deal with this once he's back. After some time traveling, he ends up on Earth. It looks so much different than Namek, way different than he expected. There's giant cities, a bunch of civilizations, and the sky, it's not green, it's blue. These things are pretty simple, but it's the first planet Kakarot's been to, outside of planet Vegeta and Namek, so he's going to be pretty amazed seeing this. Alright, but what does he do now? He needs to find Kami somehow. And that shouldn't be too hard, right? Like, he's a Namekian amongst a bunch of humans. He's gonna be the only green guy there. But the issue is, this planet is huge. There's so many people here. And even so, he doesn't know where to even start looking. He tries to sense everyone's energy. Even if he can't find Kami right now, maybe he'll find one of the humans from before. And he does get a slight pinpoint on one of the energies. That human named Krillin. He found him. Kakarot flies over, having no better idea of what to do. He ends up on a secluded island in the middle of the ocean. All that's there is a house, an old man, his turtle, and of course, Krillin. Roshi's confused and a little bit startled to see this guy here, but Krillin says it's okay. Kakarot introduces himself and learns Roshi's name too. Krillin is just as surprised though. He didn't expect Kakarot to be here. Why did he come all this way from Namek? Well, there's been a bit of an issue. He tells Krillin everything that's gone on so far. The war with Frieza, the fact that Guru died, the fact that Nail died, and the fact that they don't have Dragon Balls for a bit of time. But really, he did want to come to Earth just to get away from Namek for a while. Also for a little bit of training here. He was looking for Kami but didn't know where to start looking, and Krillin tells him he came to the right place. He leads Kakarot to Kami's lookout, and they go up to the top. That's why he couldn't find him. He's in a completely different realm from everyone else. Which makes sense, he is a guardian after all. 
but this is way different from what he saw with Guru. He greets Kami, who's glad to see Kakarot here. He asks how things have been on Namek, and they could have been better, but hey, they did make it out fine. Kami is also filled in on everything too, and he doesn't mind helping at all. The issue is, the Dragon Balls aren't in specific places like they are in Namek. They're just randomly scattered about Earth. He can't really do too much in terms of getting them instantly, but he can at least help Kakarot find the Dragon Balls. They use Purunga after all. Kami doesn't mind Kakarot using Earth's Dragon Balls too. But Kakarot also asks what's been happening here on Earth. Well, ever since they stopped King Piccolo, things have been pretty good. They've been rebuilding. Of course, King Piccolo did cause a lot of damage. But with Shenron, they were able to bring people on Earth back. And there's been a bunch of people training here to prevent this from happening again. Just in case there's another threat like this, they need to be as strong and as prepared as possible. But things have been fine. But Kami's confused as to why Kakarot wants to train here. He's clearly in a different realm of power from everyone here. But Kakarot says it's not strength that he's looking for. He was hoping maybe he could find some more types of knowledge here on Earth. Maybe Kami has a special technique. Maybe someone else can teach him something. He wants to make his trip as worthwhile as possible. Besides just reviving Nail. Everyone goes to search for the Dragon Balls, and it doesn't really take too long, especially with Kakarot there who's incredibly fast. Once the locations of them are pinpointed, they're all gathered together, and they summon Shenron. Kami also mentioned something pretty interesting. Ever since their encounter with King Piccolo, he also did upgrade the Dragon Balls as well. They're pretty much the same as they were before, but Shenron can grant three wishes now, just like Purunga. But he still has some limitations. Thankfully, a wish to revive Nail shouldn't take too much energy from him. That's a pretty tame wish. So, Kakarot asks Shenron to revive Nail and he does so with ease. He's surprised. He expected this to be a lot tougher, but he was able to make it to Earth without encountering any trouble, and he got Shenron's wish. And Kami tells Kakarot. He hates to be kind of a downer, but there's not really much he could teach Kakarot. He seems to already have so much in terms of abilities, especially since he's been training around Namekians anyways, and it's not like Kami has anything special. Well, he does have one technique that he could teach Kakarot, the Mafuba. In case he ever encounters anyone like Frieza in the future, there is this technique. If a battle gets too tough for him to fight, and raw strength isn't going to cut it, he can break out this technique. It'll seal any evil person, and as long as that seal isn't broken, they'll remain there for good. Yeah, he's never learned anything like that, and he's pretty intrigued by this, so he trains with Kami for a bit to get this technique. He considers all of this a gift to Namek for saving Earth before. Letting Kakarot take one of Shenron's wishes and teaching him this technique is nothing. Because, you know, without Namek, well, Earth wouldn't really be in a great spot right now. Amidst their training, though, Kakarot senses an energy nearby. Two energies, actually. They're approaching Earth. Oh, great. Krillin's concerned, and Ten eventually arrives on the lookout too. They all sense these evil energies, not knowing what's happening, but Kakarot tells them not to worry. He knows exactly who this is, and he'll just make this quick. They fly over to where the ships land, and off the ship step Vegeta and Nappa. They're cocky and confident at first, at least until they see Kakarot standing there waiting for them. Immediately, they have a bunch of questions. They're surprised to not see Gratis with Kakarot, and Kakarot is just as surprised too. He has no idea where his brother is. He thought he might have found the other Saiyans or something, but it seems he's gone off on his own like he said. And they press Kakarot. Why is he here? Did he know they were going to arrive here soon or something? Kakarot says no. It was just pure coincidence. But he asks them the same. Why are they here? Well, for the Dragon Balls, of course. This does come as a shock to Kakarot. He's surprised that they actually found out that this place has Dragon Balls, but it's still not a big deal. He tells him he just used them for a wish. Even though Shenron does have two more wishes, this will be a good lie. He doesn't say what the wish is, and Vegeta and Nappa begin questioning him. Did he use it to make some wish to help him against Frieza? Did he finally see what they were talking about? Well, no, he doesn't need a wish to help him against Frieza. Frieza was already killed. This is just restoring the damage that he did. Wait, did they hear him right? Frieza was killed by... by who? Kakarot just casually says it was him who did. There's no way. Kakarot's just a random low-class Saiyan. And yeah, he might be a bit strong, and he has his Namekian techniques, but he's still nothing for Frieza. If they can't defeat Frieza, how is he supposed to? Well, Kakarot says that there's one thing they're forgetting, but he doesn't blame them. They haven't seen this, and they probably don't even know what this is. They think he's bluffing too, so he shows off that he's not lying by turning Super Saiyan. This catches everyone off guard, the humans and Kami too. They've never sensed a power like this. They knew Kakarot got much stronger from before, but they didn't know he was this much stronger, and that he had a transformation on top of that. And obviously Vegeta and Nappa are speechless. They can't believe what they're seeing. It's actually a Super Saiyan. And not only does it exist, but it exists within Kakarot, a random low-class warrior that isn't even with Saiyans right now. He's pretty much the antithesis to Saiyans at the moment, and he somehow became a Super Saiyan. Kakarot detransforms, telling them to consider this a warning. Don't come to Earth causing trouble, or Namek for that matter too. With Kakarot at its current power right now, they're not going to be able to defeat him at all. And as much as they hate to admit it, he's right. They have nothing to do right now. They believe what Kakarot said about the Dragon Balls, thinking that there's no way they could actually get a wish here. And even if the Dragon Balls were here, well, Kakarot's too strong for them to fight. They couldn't do anything against him. If they try, they're just gonna die easily. They came all this way and did all that research for nothing. 
And while they'd love to fight right now, they can't. Angrily, they depart, and Krillin asks why he's letting them go. He tells Krillin not to worry. He's fought those two before and beat them already. He could beat them again, and if they try to cause more trouble, he doesn't even care. They're not anywhere near his level at the moment, even if they somehow become Super Saiyans, he'll still be above them. Besides, he's already seen another Saiyan change, his brother, the one that he mentioned before when he was catching everyone up. Who knows, all they wanted after all was Frieza to be dead, and Kakarot accomplished that goal. Yeah, they were angry, but not too angry. Maybe they'll be off doing something else. Maybe they'll stop being the genocidal Saiyan warriors that they are. What else do they have to do at the moment? Alright, now that that's done, Kakarot can finally leave, going back to Namek. He does wonder what Vegeta and Nappa are going to be up to though, but he doesn't really care too much. He knows he'll probably see them eventually anyways. And just as he's boarding his ship, of course there's another interruption. Ten asks everyone if they feel something too. They don't feel any energies, but they feel a rumbling. And it's not like an earthquake or something. They feel the presence of humans being destroyed. As if there's chaos going on somewhere, a bunch of people are dying at once. Wait, what? Is this Vegeta and Nappa? They immediately rush over, and they see something that they didn't really expect. Not even the humans know what this is at first. It's not the Saiyans, they can't even sense who it is, it's just two humans there. Somehow they're destroying stuff with ease, but there's no key to be sensed. Kakarot's confused, why can't they feel their energy? The humans have no answer either, they have no idea what's going on right now. But then Ten notices something far away. One of those fighters, on his shirt, he has an emblem on there. It's not possible, but the Red Ribbon Army logo's on his shirt. They can't be Red Ribbon Army soldiers, can they? They were defeated so long ago. The two fighters notice the humans in Kakarot, flying over to where they are. This is exactly what they wanted. They have the objectives to kill Krillin, Roshi, and Tenshinha. But they don't know who this other guy is. They don't have any data on him whatsoever. They introduce themselves, Android 17 and 18. Krillin tries to attack them, but it does nothing. Punches and kicks do no damage, and even Key Blasts don't either. Ten tries the same thing. Nothing's working. Unless they attack with their full power, they can't even injure them. And even then, the injury isn't even much. But there's something different to know about 17 and 18 here. Thankfully, without Goku or even Kakarot, they're much weaker since they're only based on Jiro's research of the humans and King Piccolo. Their power isn't adjusted to surpass someone like Kakarot or even the Saiyans. Jiro's only data and research is based off of people that were already on Earth, so he missed out on a lot of interesting stuff. These androids, they're a lot stronger than the humans here. Even if they get stronger and all grouped together, there's no way the androids are going to be defeated by the humans. But Jiro didn't account for Kakarot. It's not his fault though, he couldn't have known. And the androids are just as confused too. This guy, he is a human, right? How do they not know about him? Why is he hanging out with these other strong fighters? Kakarot says that's where they got it wrong. He has no idea who they are, and still is confused as to why they're even here, but he says he's not scared of them. Seventeen goes over to attack Kakarot. Kakarot blocks the attack. He could definitely feel it. These two are strong, but he's in base right now, and he was wide open for that attack. He's a bit injured by it, but he's still not too worried. Seventeen laughs. There's no point in being so cocky if you can't support them. Look at that. He couldn't even brush off 17's attack. He clearly was injured by it. But Kakarot keeps his same nonchalant demeanor. Those two are pretty strong, but there's a few things that they're missing. One, they don't know who he is. Two, they don't know his true power. And three, they're mechanical. Their mechanical power as of now has some limits. Kakarot doesn't have the same limits. They have no clue what he means. He's just babbling nonsense. 18 gets ready to attack, saying she'll make this quick, and letting 17 take the humans. And Kakarot simply transforms into Super Saiyan. Of course, they can't sense his energy, but they can feel the presence of him, the gust of wind, the heat and force of the aura, they feel all of that. On top of the fact that Kakarot has physically changed. What is this? A transformation? This guy definitely isn't human, and a fight ensues. He tells the humans to watch out. These two are way too strong for them, as much as he hates to admit it. No offense. But he'll handle them as a gift. Kakarot launches up into the air, coaxing the androids to follow him. He just needs to get the humans away from them. The androids fly up together, trying to attack Kakarot both at once. They're able to get some hits in, and even some blasts too, but as they attack more and more, they see Kakarot's not taking any damage. Okay, well, he might be strong, but they still have infinite energy. That could help them. They just gotta use their full power and launch everything they've got at him. They power up fully, charging the largest key blasts that they can, launching them rapid fire at Kakarot. Each android goes on a separate side, with Kakarot in the middle as they barrage him with key blasts. A bunch of explosions occur. Ten and Krillin watch from the ground below. What is he doing up there? He's just taking those attacks. There's no way he's gonna survive it. 17 and 18 keep angrily launching the blasts, but they then feel a powerful gust of wind. Everything's knocked back, and all their blasts are dissipated. Kakarot chuckles a bit. He was expecting a bit more from them, but now it's his turn. Casually, with one blast in each hand, he launches an attack at each of them. And just like that, the fight is over. Well, not completely. Kakarot tells him they need to find whoever created these androids. Once they defeat him, they'll truly be safe. But if he had to send the androids out to do his bidding, 
This guy might not be too strong to begin with, but still, be careful. Find that Red Ribbon Army guy that created these androids and stop him. They thank Kakarot for his help. He tells them not to mention. It was nice coming here too. He got what he wanted and got a good experience, but now it's time for him to head home. He thanks everyone again, saying his goodbyes and boarding his ship, going back to his home planet. He's pretty excited too. Things should be okay over there. Nail's gonna be back, and Mori's gonna be the new Grand Elder, but he still can't help but feeling a little bit of a sense of dread. There's so much unknown out there. He doesn't know what Vegeta and Nappa are up to, and while he's not too worried about Raditz, there still is a bit of concern about him. Kakarot doesn't know what he's up to. Mostly it's worry though. He doesn't think Raditz is gonna pull anything, he's just worried that his brother will get into some trouble. But there's also Slug. While he was gone, he didn't know what's been going on in Nam, and this gets him worried. Slug was definitely planning something. Maybe he's gonna come back and attack them. Kakarot eventually arrives back on Namek, and the first thing he does is go to Nail. He's glad to see him again, but Nail's wondering why Kakarot's so paranoid. And Kakarot says he doesn't know. Slug's up to something, and it definitely can't be good, but it seems like they're fine. He hasn't returned, at least not yet, and hopefully it stays that way. Hopefully they can prepare for whatever's coming up to them. Meanwhile, Slug is still out in space. If he can't take over Namek and form an army there, that's fine. He can do that somewhere else, and he'll grow stronger while he's at it. He thinks back to what he saw in the battle against Frieza. All those Namekians were strong, but they weren't as strong as him, besides Nail. But even with Nail there, that still doesn't matter. Slug thinks he could surpass everyone. He's a prodigy after all. He's gotten so strong so quickly. And there's one thing that's been on his mind too. Kakarot became a Super Saiyan, and he's heard legends of something else similar to that, a Super Namekian. He doesn't exactly know what it is, but he knows it's gonna give him some great power. And just as Kakarot found out what a Super Saiyan was, Slug wants to find out what a Super Namekian is. But it's not just that that's changed about him. He's even taken on a new alias too. From now on, he's no longer gonna be known as Slug. He needs a more fitting title, Lord Slug. Much better. Far out in space, Slug is continuing his training. He can tell he's definitely getting somewhere, but he still needs more time. If he keeps up with this, eventually he'll be strong enough to not only rule over Namek, but everywhere. He can rule the entire galaxy, maybe even more. His goals are getting even bigger and bigger. The stronger he gets, the more he wants. But obviously, this is all gonna take some time. He needs to return at exactly the right time. Not too early, not too late. By now, Kakarot's probably back there, and that's his biggest threat. But if he's able to defeat Kakarot, Namek will be his, as well as the Dragon Balls and all the power he can get. Back on Namek, Kakarot's training with Nail. He's very glad to have his master back, but Nail still wonders why Kakarot's so paranoid. He knows Slug might be trouble, but it can't be that bad, right? There's no way he's not gonna be something that they can't handle. But Kakarot doesn't really know. He tells Nail, they both remember how strong he was. He may have not been on their level, but he was close. And even though Kakarot does have Super Saiyan right now, who knows? Maybe Slug will find something different, something similar to that that'll make him very strong. They don't even care about his intentions either. They just know that they're malicious, and that's why they need to stop him at any cost. Nail hears Kakarot out more and more, and realizes that he might be right. Slug had to have left for a reason. He was so set on trying to rule Namek. There's no way that he's not gonna return. He's probably out training somewhere, trying to seek some new power to actually do this. But Nail tells Kakarot to stop worrying. They've encountered bigger threats before. Slug shouldn't be that bad. They know him. They know his fighting style. And even though he can get strong, he probably can't get too strong. At least not at the rate that they do. As long as they train, they'll be perfectly fine. The two start to prepare, not knowing when he's gonna arrive or if he's even gonna come back. They know it's likely, but they don't know the details. Slug continues his training elsewhere. And at a certain point, he considers himself a Super Namekian. This is exactly what he was aiming for. There's no changes in his physical form like a Super Saiyan has. But he could tell. He's changed. He's accessed a new realm of power. He feels so energized. And that evil impulse within him, it's greater than ever. Whether this is an actual new state for him, or just some mental thing, he's not entirely sure. He begins his conquest though. If he's gonna eventually go to Namek, he's gotta start small first. It might be worth it to actually test out his power and his conquest skills. From across space, Kakarot and Nail feel its familiar but malicious energy. It's definitely Slug. He's out there somewhere, and something just happened. Maybe this is a signal. It's some sort of proof that maybe he's about to come back to Namek. And that power that they felt, it's nothing like they've ever felt before, not to mention the distance that they felt it over. That must mean he's a pretty big deal right now. The rest of the Namekians prepare too. The good thing is, none of the others are like him. They don't have that evil instinct that he has. And they don't want to join his side. Namek is a peaceful place. And with Mori as the Grand Elder ruling over, it stays the same way that it did when Guru was there. But of course, Slug wants to destroy that all. He wants all the Namekians to join him, become strong, form an army. Not like the one they made in self-defense against Frieza, but an offensive one. With their power and abilities, Namek can expand across the universe, and under Lord Slug's rule, he can accomplish this. But in terms of his power now, he actually doesn't even care about that. If this doesn't go well, it doesn't matter. He can just kill the Namekians and move on to another place. It'll be an experience for him to get stronger. This is their last chance to join him, 
All he needs now is the Dragon Balls too. He can enhance his power that way. So he does need to return regardless just for that. He ventures out into space, going back to his home planet. Not long after, he arrives just like Kakarot and Nail expected. And once he gets there, there's an entire Namekian army waiting for him. He steps off his ship, greeting everyone. It's good to see them again. He sees this army here. Is this all for him? Are they going to join him, or are they going to fight him? Kakarot says that he should know the answer. Slug chuckles. They clearly don't know where his power is right now. But it's fine. He doesn't blame them for that. He has to demonstrate it, after all. And he tells them they have one last chance. Anyone who wants to join him now should step up and join him. Otherwise, they'll just die with the rest. Kakarot tells him he really doesn't know what he's up against, does he? He saw Kakarot before. He's a Super Saiyan. And Slug says he knows. He knows what Kakarot's power was like. And knowing that Kakarot is a Saiyan, he knows he probably got a lot stronger during this time period. But Slug's a prodigy, a mutant. His growth is insanely fast as well, and Kakarot and Nail both know this. He says he's endured the harshest training he could, trying to gain as much power as he possibly can. And he feels confident. At his current level, he'll be enough to beat all of them, including the Super Saiyan Kakarot. It seems like there's no way to talk him out of this. Kakarot powers up into Super Saiyan, being the first one to launch into battle. The rest of the Namekians actually don't fight there. They're mainly there for support. If they all fought at once, they know they'd be putting their lives at risk and just getting in the way. As they watch Slug fight with Kakarot, they realize how big the gap in power is. Even though they're all really strong, especially after the fight with Frieza, none of them individually could help in this battle, besides Nail, of course. And Nail does join in to help. Slug begins laughing. He sees a surprised look on Kakarot's face. What's wrong? All that cockiness is gone. Maybe Kakarot realized what he was truly up against, that Slug wasn't bluffing at all. And Kakarot says that's not it. He knew Slug wasn't bluffing. They've been preparing for this all along. He's just surprised that Slug went through with it. He knew Slug was plotting something, but he didn't expect him to follow through. It's a pretty bold maneuver, and Nail comments on this as well. He tells Slug it's not too late. He could return to his old ways, use that power for good, help Nail. Sure, he's committed transgressions against everyone, but they could reform him, and Slug says he's far beyond that now. He's thinking perfectly clearly, and his mind is set on one goal, power, and that can be achieved through conquest, specifically conquest of Namek. He shows off more of his power, and Kakarot's surprised. This is actually going to be a tough battle. At first, Kakarot does seem to have the advantage, especially with Nail being there helping him, but there's an issue. Super Saiyan is very draining. He hasn't perfected it at all yet. When he's been using it, which hasn't been much, he's only been using it for the raw power that it provided. He knew this was an issue with it, but he never actually tried to refine it yet, or at least found a way to. He's been trying to circumvent this, but as of now, it's still somewhat draining for him. But with his training, he does have a few ideas of how to accomplish this. Maybe this battle will be the catalyst for him. It'll force him to unlock it in whatever way possible. If he figures out how to make Super Saiyan as efficient as possible, he'll win here. He just needs focus, but he's lacking that in this battle. He can't focus his power, so he tries. Nail notices this changed demeanor. Kakarot's fighting differently. He's trying to contain as much power as possible and use it as efficiently as he can. Slug starts noticing a difference too. Kakarot's not getting as tired as he was before, but it's not like he's moderating his output either. He's using as much power as possible as Super Saiyan. And as long as Kakarot can maintain this focus, he could use Super Saiyan with all this efficiency. Slug has a simple objective. He needs to break that focus somehow. That'll give him the upper hand in this battle. It'll make Kakarot tired out, giving the perfect opening for Slug to kill him. First, he needs to get Nail away. With one arm stretched out, he grabs Nail. His arm extends far away, as he drives Nail into the ground and keeps on pushing downwards. He's on the complete opposite side of the planet, being pushed lower and lower towards the core. Of course, Slug can't see what he's doing, and Nail does eventually break free. But this gives him the time that he needed. He's alone with Kakarot. Some of the other Namekians join him to try and help fight. But without any effort at all or any hesitation, Slug easily kills them. He knew the Namekians were weaker than him, but not by this much. Kakarot looks on in horror, and Slug sees this change in his expression. This is the key to make him lose focus. Anger, these raw emotions. Slug launches another attack into the crack. The Namekians try and defend it, but Slug uses all of his power. Kakarot attacks to try and stop it as well, and Slug defends against him. He's got a much better idea now. As Kakarot fights him, Slug begins growing in size, slowly becoming a giant Namekian once more. Of course, this isn't to increase his power. This is just to make it easier for him to fight a large crowd. He knocks Kakarot away and sets his sights on the Namekians. They all try and attack back, but nothing's working, and Slug goes on a killing spree. Kakarot even jumps in front of them, trying to stop all of this. But he's feeling a bit drained again, and Slug sees what's happening. He was able to do it. He made Kakarot lose that focus, and that leaves him vulnerable. He steps on Kakarot, crushing him into the ground. Nail comes back too, and is once again knocked far away by Slug. Kakarot is under Slug's foot. He's injured and trying to push it back. And even though Slug is making him lose focus, he's also doing something else. He's making Kakarot unreasonably angry, pushing him to the brink of death too. Kakarot watches helpless as Namekians around him are slaughtered. He's getting mad, 
angrier than he ever was before. Slug is no different than Frieza, and he yells this out too. He's just another tyrant disrupting peace for no reason, and he knows the stakes behind this too. He wants the Dragon Balls just like Frieza. He wants to kill everyone here just like Frieza. He's changed so much. He went from being an Emekian to a monster, and Kakarot wants all this to stop. His friends, they're all dying, but he's too weak. Nothing he could do could help. He could try the Mafuba, but he's pinned down. He needs an opening for this. Slug stomps down on him again and again, but eventually he feels some resistance. Kakarot stands up, lifting Slug into the air. Slug tries to step down on him again, but Kakarot catches his foot. He grunts and then shouts, launching Slug way up into the sky. His aura flares up, way beyond where it was before. The other Namekians all watch on. Nail's confused too. Electricity courses through the area, and Kakarot's hair spikes up even further. His energy soars, and he's completely blinded by anger. Slug's floating up in the sky. What is this? He launches down in the ground. His fist is out in front of him and he's ready to kill Kakarot. It seems he unlocks some new power, a new evolution of Super Saiyan maybe. As Slug flies down towards him at immense speeds, Kakarot puts both hands out in front of him. He launches a massive wave of ki from each hand, pushing Slug back and injuring him. And as much as he's blinded by his anger right now and would love to just kill Slug right here, he knows that's not going to be possible. He doesn't want to draw this battle out for any longer. Slug surprises the sudden increase in power, but more surprisingly, Kakarot pulls something out of his pocket. It's a small jar of sorts. He places it on the ground. Kakarot doesn't know what just happened to him, but this is his opening. Immediately, he takes the opportunity, performing a Mafuba. Slug is caught up by this wave, and he's unsure of what to do. He tries to escape, but he can't. Nothing's working. He gets closer and closer to the jar as Kakarot throws him down. And at the last second, he gets an idea. He splits away from himself. He's not able to evenly split. Most of his power ends up getting sealed with his main body in the Mafuba jar. But he does clone himself into another copy, although he's a lot weaker. He's breathing heavily, unsure of what that was, and Kakarot looks on disbelief. There's no way. He circumvented the Mafuba. Angrily, Slug launches at Kakarot, and Kakarot's not sure what to do. The good thing is Slug is a lot weaker, but Kakarot's also weakened too. He's lost a lot of energy, and he's pretty injured. Even though he unknowingly transformed into Super Saiyan 2 and had that burst of power before, his energy is still fleeting, and pretty rapidly. But right now he has the advantage in strength. He just needs to kill Slug as quickly as possible. But then he notices something weird. During his battle, he sees a meteor in the sky. Slug looks up too, unsure of what it is. Nail props himself up weakly, trying to see what's going on. Wait a second, he senses some power coming from it. He recognizes what it is. Kakarot's too caught up in the battle to even try and sense what's going on. But he and Slug are then both blinded by a bright light. Just about this point, Kakarot powers back down into base. He has no energy left to help him. He could try transforming into Super Saiyan again, or whatever that form was that he just unlocked. But it might kill him, it'll put too much stress on his body. But as he looks up at this bright light, he feels weird. Wait, that's no normal light. Slug looks on in confusion, and then in horror. Kakarot begins growing, larger and larger. That light was an artificial moon. He transformed into a great ape just now. And thankfully, unlike Super Saiyan, this isn't draining power from him. He could use this easily. He's surprised he didn't think of it before. And this power boost should still be enough. Even though the battle is a lot closer right now, this will help. But he wonders, how did that ball appear there? And then he realized what happened. That wasn't a meteor. That was a spaceship. Over the horizon, another great ape runs towards them, jumping high up into the sky, stomping down a slug who's now smaller after the Mafuba. It's Raditz. He tells Kakarot not to ask questions, just finish this quickly, he'll answer everything later. Slug faces the combined might of Kakarot, Raditz, and Nail, as well as the remaining Namekians who try and jump in to help. He gets beat up more and more, taking more damage, even to the point where he can't regenerate much. Kakarot then grabs onto him, lifting him upwards. This is what a super Namekian is? That's kind of pathetic. He opens his mouth and a large ball of energy forms in front of it. He claps his hands together, stunning Slug midair, launching a massive mouth blast that incinerates him. He then powers down, going back into his base form along with Raditz. He has so many questions right now. What was that power that he accessed during battle? Why is Raditz here? And how did he know to come just now? And also, how are they supposed to revive all those Namekian? Well, Nail tells Kakarot not to worry about that. Sure, they all did die, which is a tragedy, but they have the Dragon Balls. They can't use Paranga though, he can only revive one person at a time. Well, before he could. But now with Mori as the Grand Elder, he made some upgrades. And thankfully, because Kakarot protected the Dragon Balls, those Namekians will be back soon. They just need to ask Purunga. Oh, good. Well, that kind of diminishes his anger, but still. This actually really helps lift up his mood. Okay, but then he turns to Raditz. Why is he here? Well, Raditz has a lot to tell Kakarot. He's been up to some stuff out in space, but first he explains why he's here and how he even knew to get here. When Slug first powered up a few days beforehand, he knew that there was probably trouble. In all honesty, he never really liked that slug guy, and he knew Kakarot didn't like him too much either. He assumed the worst, and thought that by the time he arrived on the planet, it would already be desolate and everyone would be dead. But thankfully, as he got close by, he sensed his brother's power soar as well. 
but it also started going down so he thought he might have needed a little help. Hence the artificial moon. He knows that he joined in at the end and didn't add too much in the battle, but Kakarot still says that he was a huge help. Raditz' mood seems different too. It seems he really has changed for the better, unlike those other two sayings. Wait, Vegeta and Nappa, he's seen them? Yeah, Kakarot's actually surprised. He thought Raditz might have gone back with them and probably tried to reform them or something. But he tells Raditz they're the same old selves. He met them back on Earth. The two of them catch up with each other, and Mori gathers his Dragon Balls together to revive all the Namekians that fell against Slug. It seems Namek is safe now, purged of the evil Namekian. But still, Kakarot has a lot of questions. What was that power that he got? Even though it was brief, it was insane. If it wasn't for that, he wouldn't have been able to partially seal Slug and claim victory. Speaking of which, the sealed part of Slug is stored away somewhere safe. They make sure that no one will be able to access it or break it. But also, what's Raditz been up to? He's just been absent completely. Of course, he explained why he was here and how he even got here. But Kakarot's actually curious as to what he's been up to. Well, Raditz has been doing a little bit of everything, really. Besides some cliche soul searching and some training, he also has kind of become a mercenary for hire. Of course, he's not the same kind of Saiyan he was before. He does have some sort of moral code, but this is a good job for him. He helps rid the universe of people like Frieza, he gets paid to do it, and it kills time, as well as letting him get stronger along the way. It fits perfectly into his Saiyan nature. Oh, that's interesting. Kakarot was hoping he would do something nicer, but hey, as long as he's not killing innocent people like before. That is somewhat of an improvement, at least. And Raditz has definitely grown a lot stronger. Of course, he's still nowhere near Kakarot's level, and he doesn't even know what Kakarot's been up to so far. Kakarot explains what's been going on with him, and the most shocking part is that he's a Super Saiyan. His brother, a Super Saiyan. That's awesome. He saw it briefly when he arrived on the planet, but he wasn't sure what it was, since Kakarot dropped out of it soon after. Well, Raditz initially came here to catch up with his brother and help him in whatever situation was going on, but now he has a new goal. He wants to learn how to become a Super Saiyan as well. It looks like he's going to stay here for a bit. Unexpected and unannounced. He's lucky that the people of Namek like him because he saved them before. Or at least, helped save them. And hey, after the victory against Lord Slug, they don't really have anything else better to do. And this might be good for Kakarot too. He'll be training with another Saiyan, another person like him. Of course, training with Nail's great, but Nail can only grow so strong, and he acknowledges this too. He tells Kakarot, it would be good to teach Raditz how to go Super Saiyan. He'd have someone that's closer to his level, and the two of them can grow stronger together, being great training partners. Namek is thankfully able to recover from all the damage that Slug did. Everyone's revived, and the Namekians continue their normal lives. As for Kakarot, he begins his training with Raditz. And now, we're actually going to head into a bit of a time skip. Not too much is actually happening over this time period. Raditz and Kakarot continue their training, and at some point, Raditz eventually does unlock Super Saiyan. And even better, Kakarot gets a hold on Super Saiyan as well as Super Saiyan 2. Once he fully masters Super Saiyan, it's then pretty easy for him to use Super Saiyan 2 again. And with all the years that are passing, even Raditz gets Super Saiyan 2. Of course, he doesn't stay on Namek this whole time. He goes from place to place, sometimes visiting Namek and sometimes being elsewhere. Kakarot's actually the same way too. Of course, he loves being on Namek, but he does go different places sometimes too, trying to learn new different techniques. At first, it was just him visiting Earth, but now, he's starting to go around the galaxy more and more. He actually did discover a pretty interesting planet too called Yardrat, and actually spent a few months' time there, not only to help try and train Super Saiyan 2 even more, but also because the techniques that they had there were pretty interesting. This will also make travel a lot easier, because he learned a technique called instant transmission. He didn't know something this great existed. Of course, there are Namekians on his planet that could teleport short distances, but this is something else. This will let him teleport across planets, even. Of course, there's also Force Spirit Fission, which he'd probably want to try and learn. It seems like a pretty useful technique, but he'd only use it in dire circumstances. Thankfully, over this time, there's not much activity on Namek. There's been no crazy villains showing up. And even during his trips to Earth, Kakarot makes sure that that planet's alright, and it seems like they're not having any problems either. And even though all this peacetime is great, Kakarot is a bit bored. There's nothing to work towards right now. And that's why he pursues new methods of training like Yardra. Maybe if he keeps researching, especially with the Namekian Book of Legends, he could probably find more stuff for himself. Not only will he train his body, but he's going to train his mind, as cliche as it sounds. Getting all of this knowledge will be pretty great for him. And he remembers that thing before that he saw, a Super Saiyan God. He's been thinking about it, and he still wonders if it's possible. This book says he needs five other Saiyans that are pure of heart. And he doesn't really know any other Saiyans pure of heart. Even Raditz probably isn't that pure. Hell, he doesn't even know how pure he is. And even if all the existing Saiyans that he knew about were pure, what is that, four of them total, including him? Obviously not knowing about Broly, Tarble, or anyone else. But of course, this piece isn't going to be permanent. It is Dragon Ball after all. Something bad is bound to happen eventually. One day, the Namekians notice a new ship approaching the planet. Now, this isn't that out of the ordinary, but it's still weird because they weren't expecting any ships to approach, and they don't know if it's a threat or not. And it's weird. At first, they don't sense anyone aboard. It could be someone incredibly weak, or it could just be someone hiding their key for some reason. A few of them decide to check it out. On another part of the planet, 
Kakarot is doing some training with Raditz. And not long after, a few Namekians show up. He feels like they might want to join the training, but something's weird about them. Kakarot notices that they look very odd in their stature, and then on their heads they have something on there. It's the letter M? He has no clue what this is. One of the Namekians lunges towards him. In his hand is some weird device. It stabs Kakarot right in his side, and Kakarot can feel his energy being drained. Thankfully, he's able to pry himself free very quickly. Using a blast of air to knock the Namekians away and not hurt them too much. He doesn't know what's going on, but he feels like they're possessed by someone. Raditz is immediately concerned, but Kakarot says he's okay. He heals up the wound and he's trying to figure out what's going on, but the Namekians immediately retreat. Whatever that thing is that they stabbed him with, it stole some of his energy. That can't be good. He needs to get that back, either by breaking the device or even using Force Spirit Fission. The two of them chase down the Namekians, but as they do, more and more of them appear. There's a couple more with M symbols on their forehead, trying to slow down Kakarot so he can't catch up to the other two. Of course, this is an issue. He can fight them pretty easily, but he doesn't want to hurt them, so he does have to hold back a lot. Eventually, he goes to where they are. He arrives at some sort of spaceship. He and Raditz are confused as to what's going on, and they can't sense anyone around besides those Namekians. All of a sudden, they feel an ominous presence behind them. The last thing Raditz hears is the swipe of a sword, right before he's instantly teleported away from there. Thankfully, Kakarot was fast enough to react. Using instant transmission to get them away, they look over to where they just were, and they see a large pink man standing there, holding out a sword. If they stood there any longer, they would have been caught off guard and probably hit directly by his sword. Both slice cleanly in half. The man then puts away his sword. He realizes that these are the two people he wants to look for. It's Deborah. He could kill them right now, but that would ruin the fun, and it would mean they won't get any energy from them. So he probably shouldn't get too excited with his sword. Of course, the two of them have no idea what's going on. And with how quickly all this is happening, even Shin and Kibito have no idea about this. They haven't shown up on the planet yet. So Kakarot and Raditz fight this guy like it's normal, not knowing that their energy is being siphoned away. With both of them being Super Saiyan 2, this fight actually isn't too hard. They're able to hold off Deborah pretty well, and Deborah realized that he might be in over his head. Even one of them alone might be enough to hold him off, but with two of them together, they completely overpower him. So he's mainly on the defensive. He does have to draw this out after all, besides the fact that he's also trying not to die. And that's the thing too, Kakarot and Raditz don't know what this guy wants. They don't want to kill him right away because they want to figure that out first. Their goal right now is to incapacitate him, and once they get the info they need, they will kill him. They're concerned about all those Namekians. They've been possessed by someone. This guy also has an M on his forehead. Maybe he's the one who did it. Little do they know, it was obviously Bobbity that did so. He's watching from his ship. Very glad that Deborah is accomplishing what he wanted. Although the Namekians didn't gather too much energy from Kakarot, it's still a good amount, and with Deborah fighting him and Raditz, he's slowly but surely getting a lot more energy. But that's the thing, it's pretty slow, and he has no way to speed this up. He could try and get another servant, but he sees no way of how to do that. There is no way he could possess Kakarot and Raditz. Deborah just needs to hold out for a little bit longer, and then they'll have all the energy that they need. Deborah is in pretty rough shape right now. The two of them have done a good amount of damage to him. Kakarot then stretches out two of his hands, lifting up rocks nearby, crushing them together to trap Deborah in between them. In order to make sure he's stuck there, Raditz then wraps key around it too. And now they have him in one spot. They ask him, what's going on? Who is he and why is he here? And what happened with all those Namekians? Deborah ends up talking, saying they won't defeat him or his master, Bobbity. Bobbity? Who's that? He tells them it's already too late. Their plan's already in motion. Their plan? Plan for what? Deborah is obviously pretty confident right now. And then his expression completely changes. Kakarot and Raditz aren't sure why, but then they look behind them seeing someone else there. There's two people. Raditz doesn't know who these people are, but Kakarot feels like he vaguely recognized them from somewhere. And then it hits him, that outfit that they have on. He read about this in the Book of Legends before. This is, this is a Supreme Kai. He has no idea what to do, so he just immediately bows, and Raditz also follows, while also both making sure that Deborah stays restrained. Shin tells them they need to make this quick. What happened so far? The two brothers realize that right away this matter must be pretty serious if a Supreme Kai showed up. Not that Raditz knows what that is, but the name sounds pretty scary. The two Kais keep Deborah under check, making sure he stays paralyzed. Kakarot explains everything that's happened so far. Damn, Shin thinks that they might actually be too late. They got some energy from Kakarot, and not to mention they had this whole fight going on between them and Deborah. But they don't sense Majin Buu yet. Maybe it's still fine. But he tells them to not stall anymore. He knows they want to get information about Deborah, but that actually worked against them because it drew out the fight. So immediately they turn back to him, killing Deborah instantly. So that at least solves one problem, but they don't know where Bobbity is in his ship. And even if they find him, they don't know how much energy Boo has. They need to be very careful. Wait, if they're trying to get energy away from Bobbity, he has an idea. If Kakar can just get close enough to wherever Boo's egg is, he could use Force Spirit Fission. Maybe he could draw the energy out of that, making sure that none of this ever happens. Force Spirit Fission? Oh, a technique of the Yard Rats. That actually might work. Shin says that's a great idea, and the four of them all head inside the ship. As long as they kill Bobbity, then the Namekians will be free of his control. They don't know how many he's taking control of, though, and as they board the ship, they see more and more. 
Now obviously this is a pretty huge issue. They gotta conserve their energy and make sure they don't expend anymore, and they can't hurt these Namekians. Kakarot tells Raditz to let him handle it. He's just gonna rely on pure martial arts. That way he could just knock them unconscious without hurting them too much. But this also wastes a lot of time. As they try and get lower and lower into the ship, Bobbidi is still collecting energy. Even though he's not getting it from everyone else, he's stealing it from his own minions. Not just the Namekians that he possessed, but also Pui Pui and Yakum. Now, it was kind of hard for him to possess the Namekians in the first place, but thankfully they were weak enough for him to do this still. Although, they're not very strong for minions. With these Namekians being so good and all, it was kind of hard to get in their mind. And that's why he's stuck with weaker Namekians. But this is good. He can at least take energy from them. Slowly, the meter's filling up. He's almost ready for Boo's revival. Then he's taken by surprise. The roof above him explodes. Four people jump through. Kakarot, Raditz, Shin, and Kabita. Kakarot's attention is immediately diverted to the egg. He rushes over there, and just as he's about to touch it, a massive hot pillar of steam ejects out of it. Kakarot's only able to narrowly avoid this. It even singes his clothing a bit. Bobbidi begins cheering. How sad. They're just seconds too late. But Kakarot's not gonna give up. He tries punching the egg, starting to steal energy from it, but nothing's working. It's already hatching. It's too late. Shin tells him he needs to get away from that right now. Nothing he does can work. Not knowing what else to do, out of anger he then turns to Bobbidi. Kakarot launches two lasers from his eyes, immediately killing the wizard. Shin and Kabito don't necessarily know if that was a great idea, because this means Boo would completely be out of control. With Bobbidi there, at least Boo would have been kept under that control. But who knows, maybe that was a good idea. He'll be less direct in his actions once he is revived. Kakarot and Raditz have no idea what to expect, but the egg then hatches. And once they actually see Boo, they realize, maybe it was a good idea to kill Bobbidi. This guy seems kind of absent-minded, and even though he definitely is out of control and chaotic, it's not like he's just gonna destroy everything instantly. Even Shin is surprised. Well, with the influence of the Grand Supreme Kai in him, he guesses it makes sense that this Boo is a lot more docile than the one that he saw. But still, they can't mistake that personality as weakness, because immediately, Boo tries to attack them, and he holds nothing back. His attacks are incredibly powerful, and he has no clue of where he is or why he's here. Kakarot's trying to think of what to do right now, but Shin says they need to get out of here as soon as possible. He's about to tell Kakarot to grab on, but he then grabs onto Raditz and everyone else and teleports them away himself. Oh yeah, they forgot this guy knew how to use Yard Art techniques. But at least that's good, that means they don't have to rely on the Kais. Kakarot's trying to come up with a plan in his mind, and Raditz is trying to do that as well. Spirit Fission might work, but he's not too sure against this guy. From what Shin's saying, this guy has his own magic. Maybe he'll be able to reverse this. Or maybe it won't even work at all. Maybe he could use the Mafuba. As long as he has an opening for this, that'll work. A sealing technique. Yeah, that might actually do okay. Thankfully, with Bobbidi dead now, all the Namekians around them are free. And with all this commotion going on, of course more show up trying to see what's happening, including Nail. They're all amazed to see a Supreme Kai here. And Kakarot explains the situation. It's dangerous and they need to get out of here as soon as possible. The entire planet might be at risk. Gather the Dragon Balls up just in case. Thankfully, it seems like they have some time to formulate a plan. Boo's not pursuing them pretty quickly. He seems to just be doing his own thing right now. But to make things even worse, they look up in the sky and see something else approaching. Shin and Kabito point it out. Is that another spaceship? Oh wait, no, it's two spaceships. Kakarot and Raditz look up and immediately their stomachs drop. They can recognize the spaceships right away, as well as the energies on them. No, why are these two showing up now? The Kais are confused, but Kakarot and Raditz go to chase down the ships. There's no way it could actually be them, can it? Why, why would they be here? Why now? The ships land and Kakarot and Raditz arrive for their landing, and it's just like they expected. Two people step off, Vegeta and Nappa. Oh, so Raditz is here too. How fun. They sarcastically say it's nice to see the two of them again. They know it's been a while. Vegeta says not to get in the way, though. He's here for the Dragon Balls, and Kakarot's not going to be able to stop him. Even if he is a Super Saiyan, that doesn't matter. Kakarot says now's not really the time for a fight. They're kind of dealing with something else pretty big right now. And this only makes Vegeta even happier. Great. That'll mean he can get the Dragon Balls while everyone else is distracted. He just needs to kill these two quick. He and Nappa then begin powering up. Their hair flashes gold. Their aura surges, and they show off Super Saiyan. They assure Kakarot. They've gotten much stronger over this time period, and this isn't even their full power right now. It's all thanks to him for showing off Super Saiyan before. It's kind of like he screwed himself over, right? Damn it. Of course they have to deal with these two at the same time as Boo. This is really going to complicate things. Vegeta and Nappa are ready to fight. Showing off Super Saiyan, glad that they've powered up. They'll take on Kakarot and Raditz together, and they'll win this time. This only annoys Kakarot and kind of pisses him off too. He tells them they came at the wrong time. They're kind of in the middle of something else. I mean, can't they sense that great power? Vegeta gets mad at this too, telling him to shut up, saying he doesn't want any distractions. He doesn't care what's going on, even if it means everything's at risk. He's gonna settle the score here. But Kakarot tells him it's not that simple. They're facing Majin Buu. He's probably more powerful than all the Saiyans combined. Even if they do win here, which they won't, what are Vegeta and Nappa gonna do against Buu afterward? The Kai's intervene, telling him the same thing. Vegeta and Nappa grit their teeth, trying to think of something to say next, but Nappa just says they'll take on Buu themselves. Vegeta agrees to this. 
Kakarot and Raditz call them idiots as they fly off, going to face Boo, trying to eliminate this threat so they can fight Kakarot and Raditz. Shin tells them that this might be good though. If they can all fight together, with Vegeta and Nappa helping them, maybe it'll actually be enough to face Boo. Kakarot's idea of Spirit Fission might actually work here, now that they have two extra people fighting with them, because this means Boo is going to be distracted and allow Kakarot to get more hits in, draining some of his energy and even taking some of his magic away. That was the main concern before, as we discussed in the last part, but maybe this could actually work out well. Wait, what are they doing? Why are they chasing these two? They stop flying midair, and they teleport to the two Saiyans, grabbing onto them and bringing them to where Boo is too. They're confused. Did they just teleport here? Kakarot says don't ask questions. If they want to fight Boo, they're going to have to fight together. Vegeta and Nappa are infuriated, but whatever. As long as they get rid of this distraction, they can fight afterwards. Kakarot's obviously going to be the main line of defense here. He's the strongest, and he has access to magic from the Mechians and Spirit Fission, as well as a multitude of other abilities. Most of the warrior Namekians stay back, knowing that they might get in the way. But as the strongest warrior Namekian and someone who can actually help, Nail joins them there too. He's also intrigued. He wonders how Kakarot's going to handle this. This is a threat that he doesn't even know how to counter. And watching Kakarot will definitely show him how far his adopted son slash student has gotten. He knows Kakarot has great strength, great potential, and great techniques. But how far does that go against an unknown powerful threat like this? Vegeta and Nappa start fighting Boo, quickly realizing that they're not going to be able to challenge him at all. You know what? Maybe Kakarot and Raditz were right. But hey, there's four Super Saiyans together. That should be enough. Boo completely and utterly embarrasses everyone. Even Kakarot's amazed. But this does show them one thing. Even if their power can't counteract Boo, Kakarot has spirit vision and his magical abilities. This might actually work. He just needs more time and more focus. With so many great fighters here, and the fact that by now Deborah and Bobbity have been eliminated, they've greatly outnumbered Boo as well. And this is easy to distract him, since he's not really the smartest fighter. Shin and Kapito thought it was hopeless before, especially once Vegeta and Nappa got there to distract everyone. But this is actually working. Somehow, Kakarot and Raditz turned them against Boo. But still, Boo is way too powerful for them. Although the more time they buy, the more Kakarot gets to focus. Any of Boo's magic is countered by his own. Also magic from the Kais. But he still doesn't want to focus on that. He's mainly focused on spirit vision. He hits Boo more and more. Every time he lands another hit, he's able to drain more energy at a faster pace. At first, this isn't too much of an issue for Boo. But the more he gets hit, the more energy gets stolen. And he can replenish it, but Kakarot can keep stealing more and more energy, as much as he wants to. This makes Boo slower, and his attacks get weaker. Meaning Kakarot gets to hit him even more. It's exponential growth. Even Vegeta and Nappa see what's happening. Kakarot really is powerful, but they're not going to let that get to their heads. They still think that they can defeat him, as long as he doesn't use any of those parlor tricks. But then they see something else that makes them rethink what they just saw. They realize, he's not a normal Super Saiyan. He's beyond that. Super Saiyan 2. Raditz isn't a regular Super Saiyan as well. They're still behind, even with this new form. But more importantly, they see Boo getting much weaker as the time goes on. Eventually, it gets to a point where Kakarot's taking more energy than Boo could put out. And it's not like this energy is going nowhere. Any of the energy that Bobbidi and Deborah got from someone else, it gets returned. And as for the rest from Boo himself, Kakarot pulls it all together into one attack. He puts his hands out in front of him, flinging the massive ball down in front of him. He then condenses it, turning it into a beam. The beam explodes out, returning Boo's energy to him in a much different format. Boo tries to counter it, but more of his energy gets drained as Kakarot powers up the attack even more. He can't keep this up for long, and he can tell he's going to lose. In a fit of rage, he shows off one last burst of power, but it goes right to Kakarot and his attack. And just as Boo powers up, the attack powers up too. Boo is killed by his own energy, completely erased thanks to Kakarot's technique. That was a close call, but they're glad to be done with it. Although just as soon as Kakarot stops fighting, Vegeta then attacks him, with Nappa attacking Raditz. They told them, they still want their fight, they don't care about Boo. They need to finish this battle once and for all. Okay, well, if that's what they want, Kakarot and Raditz power up. And Kakarot even says he won't use any magic or spirit fission. Shin and Kibito and Nail watch on intrigued. With Shin and Kibito interested in Kakarot's resolve and his power, they wonder if he could actually win against these Saiyans too, even with how stubborn they're being. But I mean, they did just win against Majin Buu, so it's not too out of the question. Vegeta and Nappa power up. But their Super Saiyan is no match for Kakarot and Raditz's Super Saiyan. Yes, just a normal Super Saiyan 1, they're still ahead of these two. But they also have Super Saiyan 2. And once they power up into that, it's a done deal. Even Kakarot could have done this alone. Meaning just as quickly as the fight begins, Kakarot and Raditz are able to beat Vegeta and Nappa. And their reaction's pretty interesting. Instead of the two of them being in rage and trying to just destroy stuff and having a tantrum, they're actually content. They don't go crazy like Kakarot and Raditz expected. After seeing all this power and fighting Boo, they could tell that Kakarot and Raditz are far beyond them in strength, and they didn't get Super Saiyan like they wanted, although it didn't really accomplish much for them. They need to try for something else, and they see where their strength is. They're glad that they had this battle, they finally settled the score, and they don't need to keep thinking about fighting and what's going to happen when they fight next. Even though the outcome isn't what they wanted, they still did get what they came here for, a fair fight, one that proved which Saiyans were truly the stronger one. They got the closure that they needed. Of course, they're not going to stay here though. Surprisingly enough, they thank Kakarot and Raditz, 
telling them it was a good fight, and they enjoyed it, as well as fighting Majin Buu together. But the two get back in their space pods, heading out into space and leaving Namek. They'll do their own training, get much stronger, ascend Super Saiyan, even ascend Super Saiyan 2, and they'll beat these two once and for all. Although, that's not going to be the only thing on their minds. They gotta get over this grudge. They might never surpass these two. Kakarot is just a completely different animal, and Raditz, his new life is way better than theirs. Maybe these Saiyans can learn a thing or two. They even did offer Raditz a second chance to join them, but he of course declines. He'd rather go solo. Speaking of Raditz, well, that was a good trip to Namek, but it's about time for him to leave again. He'll keep checking in every now and then to see his brother, but yeah, he's gonna go back off into space too. The Kais thank him for his help, saying they hope to see him again. They tell him that he can feel free to train with them whenever he wants, and Raditz might take them up on that offer soon enough, but for now, he needs a break from all the training and fighting. He's gonna take a little bit of a vacation. He heads off into space, and the Kais turn to Kakarot. Nail also commends Kakarot for his effort, and the Kais have an interesting proposition. They also want Kakarot to train with them too, and this shocks Kakarot. He did hear it get offered to Raditz, so he kind of expected this, but still, this is awesome. After all he's heard about the Kais and what they did here, even though it wasn't much, Kakarot's still honored to be even considered for this. He could learn so much there. He does have all that knowledge from the Namekian Book of Legends like I've mentioned before in the series. And these two can give him so much more info even beyond that. He turns to Nail, and Nail says this is his nice next step in his training. Nail can only teach him so much after all, and he can only grow so strong in Namek. Training with the Supreme Kai? That's a completely different level. He tells Kakarot he should go. Go off and learn more about the universe. Get as strong as he possibly can, and come back whenever he wants. Kakarot's already made up his mind. He's gonna go with the two Kais, and he accepts the offer, as they bring him to the sacred world of Kais. Even Kabito is amused too. As someone who never really liked mortals too much before, this gives him a new perspective, especially Kakarot. He seems pretty amazing, not just in terms of power, but everything about him. Shin of course thinks the same thing too. They have a few ideas in mind of what they could train him with, but Kakarot also has a question. He read up in the Namekian Book of Legends about something called a Super Saiyan God. Do they know anything about that? And they're not actually sure. They've only heard legends and rumors. But maybe something could work. Maybe they can figure out something. I mean, if it is godly form, they're gods, and they can give him godly key. Or at least, they can help him obtain it. So, this is the best idea that they have in mind. If he trains with them, he might be able to unlock this without even knowing. He does know about the ritual, but he can't do that. There's not enough of the kind of Saiyans that he needs. He only knows of three Saiyans, and only one of them would probably work in the ritual. Vegeta and Nappa would definitely be no help. Well, it seems like he's gonna have to try and find Super Saiyan God some other way. It is in the Namekian Book of Legends after all, but it's called a Book of Legends. It might not even be real. Regardless, the Kais begin training with Kakarot trying to see where his strength can go from here. He already has a good amount of magic. Maybe he could even learn some things from them, become an apprentice Kai even. He thinks this actually sounds pretty cool. It would be a great next step in his training, and he's already a great fit for it. Even if he's not learning any new forms or whatever, he can learn new techniques at the very least. He even does train with the Z-Sword, thankfully not breaking it, and he learns to become very proficient with it. This training continues for a while. Of course, Kakarot goes back and forth, being able to freely go from the sacred world of Kai's and Namek. He even basically gets a better version of instant transmission with Kai Kai. He doesn't even need to detect energy signatures, he can just teleport wherever the hell he wants. It's amazing. He hasn't gotten any new form so far, but he has powered up Super Saiyan 2 even further. And with that alone, it's still more than enough for any fight that he encounters in the future. Or at least, he thinks it'll be enough. By now, he's definitely heard of Lord Beerus. And one day, Shin and Kibito could sense his presence. He's woken up again. Kakarot knew this day would come eventually, but he wasn't really sure when. It could have been a few days from when he started training, a few weeks, a few months, a few years. He never knew. But now's the time. Maybe he knows something about a Super Saiyan God. Beerus ends up going to the sacred world of Kai's, hearing from Whis that they have a new student, an apprentice Kai who's a Saiyan. And Beerus is thinking the same exact thing as Kakarot without even knowing. He had a premonition about some sort of Super Saiyan God. He doesn't know if it's real, but if there's a Saiyan on the sacred world of Kai's, that's probably his best lead towards it. He introduces himself, with Kakarot feeling very excited but also very nervous. And he has a pretty simple question for Kakarot. Does he know anything about a Super Saiyan God? And Kakarot looks up confused. Yeah, he was actually going to ask Beerus the same thing. Really? Interesting. It seems his premonition definitely did have some truth to it. And Kakarot does know some things about Super Saiyan God, at least from what he's been told in the legends. He said they've been trying to work towards this. And Kakarot's been trying to harness Godly Key for himself. The only other way is through a ritual, but there's no way to do the ritual. They don't have the amount of righteous hearted Saiyans that they need. Actually, they barely have the amount of Saiyans in general. That definitely might be an issue, but Beerus and Whis still feel they could help. Although first, Beerus needs to test out his power. He tells Kakarot to power up, show him everything he's got, don't hold anything back. So, Kakarot does so. He goes into Super Saiyan 2, telling Beerus this is a level beyond Super Saiyan. He assumes Super Saiyan God is even beyond this, but this is good enough so far, he feels. He begins rapidly teleporting around too using Kai Kai, utilizing not only strength and speed, but also magic here. A dark shadow is suddenly casted over Beerus. A block of Kachin is formed over him. It drops down and with a single finger, he breaks it in half. 
The distraction allows Kakarot to get in closer, nearly hitting Beerus right in the face with the punch. Beerus even looks shocked at the speed, but he catches Kakarot's fist still. Kakarot then tries to kick Beerus aside, but Beerus is able to dodge quickly, then kicking Kakarot into the ground. That one kick alone had so much power, it sends him into the dirt. Beerus then rockets down towards him as Kakarot teleports up in the air. Wait, he hit Beerus. Maybe Spirit Vision will work here. He begins trying to steal some of Beerus' energy, but he can't. He can't even sense what Beerus' energy is. He just realized this and asked Beerus, what's up with that? Oh, he can't sense him. That means he hasn't access to true godly key yet. Of course, maybe he's picked up on some trace amounts from the Kais, but if he wants that, he's gonna have to really train hard with him and Whis. And maybe he could pick up some along the way there. The fight continues, but of course, Kakarot ends up losing. No matter what he pulls out, his power isn't nearly enough, and none of his amazing techniques work. Although, Beerus is still pleased. For a mortal, this is an insane amount of strength. Assuming the Super Saiyan God is real, and it's way more powerful than this, Beerus has high hopes for Kakarot and how far he can go in the future. He simply tells Shin, he's gonna take Kakarot as his student instead. At first, Shin and Kibito are hesitant. I mean, it's their student after all. But then they realize, he's always gonna be an apprentice Kai. This will just help him get stronger and stronger. Maybe Beerus can teach him more, and Whis especially. And Kakarot's definitely up for it too. Although they're not 100% into it, they let Kakarot go with him. And Whis is very excited too. It's been a while since he's had to train someone, and this will be unique, training a mortal to try and get godly key. He wonders if it'll be possible for Kakarot. Kakarot then departs going to Beerus' planet, but all this time, there's been a bunch of other stuff happening out in space. Of course, Vegeta and Nappa are on their own. Thankfully, they're not going around just genociding people at random. They're kind of just doing their own thing and training, whatever to get stronger. They're trying to pursue Super Saiyan 2, and maybe even something beyond them. They wonder, maybe they can team up with Raditz again. Of course, Raditz wouldn't want to join them, but if they joined under him instead, that would really help, and he could teach them some things. Although, they're a bit too prideful to do that right now, so they keep that in the back of their mind. As for Raditz himself, he's essentially doing the exact same thing, while also still being a mercenary for hire. It's a great job for him, and he's becoming very proficient at it, one of the best assassins in Universe 7, and he's confident. Unless there's some multiverse with some really strong assassin somewhere else, which is really unlikely, then he's the strongest assassin that there ever was. Although he does do it for a good cause still. He does have a set of rules and morals, so he's not a bad guy. But yeah, there's no way there's any other assassins out there stronger than him, right? The Saiyans are all working towards something unique for themselves. But someone has their eyes set on Namek once again. There's another enemy lurking about in space. He and his crew have been waiting for a while, and he's finally found the perfect place to strike. Namek. It seems to be ripe with energy. Of course, that'll only be his first target in a long list of targets. And as of now, it doesn't seem like there's any really strong people on there besides Nail, which is perfect. It's a great opportunity to attack and get Namek's energy. And as this villain ponders his plan, an awakening occurs on Beerus' plan, as Kakarot finally gets access to Godly Key and channels it into Super Saiyan God, briefly being able to tap it to the form. It's amazing. He's never expected to feel power like this before. It's so far beyond even Super Saiyan 2. It's incredible. Combine that with his magic and his Kai abilities, and Beerus could tell. His premonition was 100% correct. Not only is the Super Saiyan God real, but this person, Kakarot, that's going to be a perfect rival. Maybe even a god of destruction in the future. Although, he is on the path of a Supreme Kai right now, so Beerus is going to have to convince him a bit. Or at least, teach him some things that a god of destruction can do that a Kai can't. Who knows if Kakarot would even want to do that, though. Kakarot continues his training with Beerus and Whis, after getting there from the last part. Super Saiyan God is great and all, but he wants to go beyond that somehow. He feels like he can. Beerus is pleased, but he also feels the same way. And Whis could tell that Kakarot could probably go beyond this level as well. It'll be interesting to see where this Saiyan goes. He definitely has a lot of untapped potential, and this is only the beginning of Super Saiyan God. This form right here, this is just the start. It's a stepping stone. He may be able to go beyond that. But who knows? The only way to actually find out is if they train for it, or at least Kakarot trains for it. Of course, he's not opposed to this idea. His training becomes harder and harder as he tries to ascend this form somehow. Meanwhile, there's a threat lurking about in space. So I kind of introduced this in the last part. It's someone that was looking at Namek, seeing that it was ripe for energy. Now I made it intentionally misleading. A lot of my scenarios do involve Moro, and the way I set it up, it kind of sounded like that. But no, it's someone completely different. There is another Saiyan lurking about, an evil one. One looking to take over the universe, getting as much power as possible. It's Turles. He's been looking around, trying to find more places to plant the Tree of Might. He already has gone to a couple planets, and he's gone completely unnoticed because there's not too many strong people in Universe 7. He's gotten pretty strong too. Of course, he's been doing it in moderation, but he has been eating multiple fruits from the Tree of Might. And unbeknownst to everyone else, he's one of the strongest beings in the universe right now. In terms of mortals, the only one who could probably counter him is Kakarot, and even then, there's no telling what would happen. But now he's aiming for bigger targets. He wanted to go somewhere like Namek or even Earth because he knew those places were ripe with energy, but there's always strong people defending against it. Namek's the real target though. If he can get that, he could probably even get the Dragon Balls while he's there, and he could test his power against an actual foe. That's Saiyan Kakarot, he's heard of rumors. 
Of course, he is a smart guy. He's been doing his research, but he has to stay away from the planet as much as possible, at least until he's strong. Or at least he knows he's strong enough. And now, it might be that time. He's been doing this for years, planting multiple trees of might. But they're all on dead planets, or very small ones. But a tree of might from Namek can make him strong enough to defeat anyone in the multiverse. Yes, that's his goal. Eventually, he wants to leave this universe, going to other universes too. If they even exist. He's heard rumors only. But even if they don't exist, who cares? He'll become the strongest being in this universe, even stronger than the God of Destruction. And there's a really good thing going on right now. Kakarot's not on Namek. It's ripe for the taking. So, he and his crew descend. Turles and the Crusher Corps go to Namek. But they're going to remain as low-key as possible first. Turles plants the seed right away. And now, they move as far away from it as possible, just so no one will suspect that anything's happening here. But it's going to go hard to remain unnoticed. If they try and fly somewhere, they'll definitely be picked up by the Namekians, especially with how high their evil energy is. But they're going to encounter a fight sooner or later, so at some point, they do need to move out. And just like they expected, as soon as they leave, Turles can see that other people are heading towards them. Perfect. It's just Namekians. The Crusher Corps begin fighting the Namekians. And Turles watches on as the Tree of Might grows. Or at least this Tree of Might. And as his subordinates handle the Namekians, he goes to the tree itself, looking for a fruit. He needs to find one that's ripe. And he's going to have to wait a bit. But the longer he waits, the better. There'll be more energy if he waits, and there'll probably even be more fruits. But he can't eat too many at once, of course. He's eaten so many at this point that he can feel something. He's going to have an evolution soon. He doesn't know what it's going to be, but maybe he's going to be a Super Saiyan of some sorts. Or something else. He doesn't know. But either way, he's strong right now as is, even without Super Saiyan transformations. And as he waits by the tree, someone else encounters him. It's Nail, the strongest of the Namekians and the strongest person on this planet right now to defend against Turles and his crew. Well, Turles does need to do something to pass the time. And if this guy is the strongest of the Namekians, maybe he'll put up a good fight. The two of them begin clashing. Of course, by now on Beerus' planet, Kakarot can sense everything that's going down. He senses that there's some sort of turmoil on Namek. Again? Why is their planet always being targeted? He feels like it has something to do with him, but whatever. That's a problem for another time. This might just be a freak occurrence that has nothing to do with him. He can't tell what this energy is, but it's weird. It's an evil energy, and it feels kind of like that of a Saiyan. But that doesn't make sense. There's only three other Saiyans in the universe, and he knows their energy, right? There can't be other ones. Of course, there's a few others there too, but that Saiyan energy... Maybe he's thinking of it wrong, but he's gonna go check it out regardless. He tells Beerus and Whis that he'll be back. This might be a good test of his power too, if this guy is a formidable foe. And maybe this is the push that he needs to go beyond Super Saiyan God. He teleports to Namek using instant transmission. And as soon as he gets there, he sees. He teleports right to Nail, who's badly beaten on the ground. Turles is floating high above them, confused. Kakarot's just as confused too. The two of them stare each other down. Why do they look the exact same? Ah, Turles is amused. He knew of Kakarot, but he didn't know he was a low-class Saiyan that looked exactly like him. It's kind of comedic. And as for Kakarot, he's just dumbfounded. Does he have another brother that he didn't know about? Well, no, Raditz did mention that there were Saiyans that looked the same because they were low-class warriors. I mean, he even said that he looked just like his father. But this guy just so happens to be another low-class Saiyan. But that doesn't explain his energy. If he's just a low-class Saiyan, first of all, how did he survive? How did he get out here? But also, why is he so powerful? Kakarot's about to attack, but before he does, Turles eats the fruit. Or at least takes a bite out of it. The energy from this fruit is so much greater than any of the other ones he's had before. He's regularly dying on the fruit of the Tree of Might. But this one? This is the finest specimen he's ever encountered. Immediately he feels power coursing through him, and Kakarot knows he can't hesitate anymore. He attacks, but Turles powers up, even bulking up considerably. He tells Kakarot what perfect timing. This is just what he needed, someone to test out this power against. And he's elated to test his power out against a Super Saiyan. It's so funny too. This is a form of legend, and he's going to be able to actually beat it. Kakarot can tell quickly. This guy is stronger than a Super Saiyan. So, he goes into Super Saiyan 2, but even that is not enough. Turles is able to contend with him. What is this power that this guy has? And Turles is equally amazed. Kakarot is strong, and this form, it's pretty impressive. But he doesn't need any Super Saiyan forms. The Tree of Might is enough for him. The two continue fighting, and Kakarot can tell that he has to end this quickly. He notices that the planet is losing its energy, and it has to do with that tree. Besides the fact that he wants to take the energy from Turles, he knows that he needs to stop this tree somehow. Of course, he has the perfect technique for that, spirit fission. All he needs to do is get a good hit on, on the tree and Turles, and he'll be able to return the energy to the planet. But first, he's going to actually need to defeat Turles, get him out of his way. And he decides he's going to end it with one attack. He powers up in his Super Saiyan God, lunging at Turles with a powerful strike. But just as soon as his fist is about to connect, Turles jumps out of the way quickly, grabbing another fruit, and taking a bite of it as quick as he can. Damn it! 
Kakarot attacks again, but it's already too late. Turles grabs his fist and begins laughing. He feels the power coursing through him. This fruit, it was even better than the last one, and the power. He knew he was on the cusp of something great, and now he's finally gonna access it. But what is that power that he was seeking? It looks like he's gonna find out, and Kakarot is too. He begins powering up. An evil red aura surrounds him, and his hair, it begins growing longer, as Turles also grows in size. What is this? This isn't a Super Saiyan form. Turles doesn't even know what it is either. All he knows is that the power is great, and he knows that this is what's gonna help him win. If you don't already know, this is the evil Saiyan form from Dragon Ball Heroes, a form that Turles did take on after eating so many fruits from the Tree of Might. And here in this story, it's gonna act the same exact way. The power from it is insane. Kakarot tries to fight him in Super Saiyan God, but it's doing absolutely nothing. And actually, Turles is way ahead. He grabs onto Kakarot, brutally beating him, doing his best to have his fun and not kill him right away. Kakarot's hopeless is counter against it. He tries attacking, but he can't do anything. Every time he tries to hit, Turles either dodges or counters it with an even stronger attack. It feels like he's getting hit by a truck every time he's punched by Turles. And even his blasts do nothing. He hits Turles point blank in the face with a powerful attack, but Turles just brushes it off like nothing hit him at all. Turles is laughing maniacally. This is amazing. If only he could have more fruits, but he knows he has to pace himself. Damn it, Kakarot's gonna die here if it keeps going on like this. He needs to be safe. He needs to do something to actually counter this. And as much as he hates to do it, he's gonna need to run away here. At one point, he's able to catch his breath quickly using the Kai Kai to teleport over to Nail, and then teleport to the Sacred World of Kais. Kakarot arrives, and the two immediately know what's going on. He tells Shin and Kibito, he needs to be healed. He hates to do this mid-fight. It seems cowardly, but there's no other way. He needs to make sure Namek isn't destroyed. And he also tells Kibito, after Kibito fully heals him, he wants him to heal Nail. He's gonna leave Nail here for the time being, and he tells him that he's gonna be back afterwards. He needs to stop this fight in any way possible. Kibito is able to heal him up fully, and now he's ready to head back. He even gets a small boost in power from it, but he doesn't know if it's going to be enough. All he knows is that he might not have a second chance to escape, so he needs to make this count. He needs to unlock whatever power he was seeking. That's what's going to be the key to victory here. That'll help him defeat Turles. But what is he going to do for that? Is it going to be from anger like when he got Super Saiyan and Super Saiyan 2? Is it going to be from calmness like it did with Super Saiyan God? Or is it going to be something else? He doesn't know yet. But either way, he teleports back, ready to take that chance. And Turles is pissed. He was a coward. He ran away. And Kakarot says it was the only way. The only way for what? He's not gonna win. Running away is gonna do nothing. And even though he came back here fully healed, that's not gonna accomplish anything either. If anything, it'll make Turles take even more delight in this defeat. Kakarot ran away, got fully healed, and he's still gonna die. It's gonna make Turles incredibly happy. But Kakarot welcomes it, powering up, lunging in towards Turles ready to fight again. And the two begin clashing once more. Kakarot's racking his brain, trying to figure out what to do to get more power. He's feeling frustrated. Nothing's working. He feels that same anger that he felt when he first went Super Saiyan and Super Saiyan 2. But it's not going to do anything here. I mean, Super Saiyan God's about calmness. Maybe he's going about it all wrong. And he keeps trying to think. He tries fighting Turles more and more, but it still isn't doing anything, even with that slight boost in power that he got. But at least this helps him last longer. Turles tells Kakarot he's going to prolong this as much as possible. Kakarot deserves to suffer for doing that. It's kind of sad that he has to kill a fellow Saiyan, but he can't have any competition in this universe. As Kakarot's being beat up, Angrily, he then throws a punch at Turles, and this one actually hits him and does some damage. And for a brief second, Kakarot saw a blue aura coating his fist. What the hell was that? He feels power coursing through him, but it disappears. He tries again. He can't summon it, but then he keeps thinking. He realizes what he needs to do. Wait a second. He's been going about this all wrong. It's not a new form that he's trying to unlock. He just needs to combine two forms, Super Saiyan and Super Saiyan God. Maybe he could do that. I mean, it might be a long shot. It might not even be possible but it's at least worth a try. There's only one way to find out. If he tries to summon that power on top of Super Saiyan God, it might work. He needs to distract Turles first. He begins spawning blocks of Kachin around him, dropping them from the sky just like he did against Beerus as a distraction. Of course, Turles is able to destroy these easily, but as he does so, Kakarot begins powering up, trying to tap into the same power. He needs to remain calm though. He needs that same anger, but also calmness. It's kind of a weird contradiction, but maybe he'll be able to make it work. And he finds that nice middle ground, a completely blank mind and that power begins coursing through him. His aura changes. It goes from red to blue. As Kakarot is encased by it, Turles is unsure of what's going on, but as the blocks of Kachin keep falling from the sky, a blue blur then attacks him. And it's Kakarot, with another powerful punch. And as soon as the punch lands, that aura breaks. It's almost like glass. It shatters around Kakarot, revealing a brand new form, Super Saiyan Blue. Kakarot's elated. This is just what he needed. He's ready to defeat Turles with this power. And he knows that this is gonna lead him to victory. But first, he needs to take care of that tree. Turles tries attacking him, and Kakarot doesn't even try countering it. 
he just teleports out of the way. Turles stumbles midair, and then sees Kakarot behind him, right at the tree, and Kakarot begins punching the tree. Why is he attacking the tree? What's that gonna do? But Turles looks on. The tree begins shrinking. The fruits on it, they begin disappearing. Turles tries to grab the fruits before they disappear, but they're already gone, sucked back into the tree as the tree begins shrinking. Before he can even ask Kakarot what he's doing, he's then hit in the face by another punch. Kakarot begins rapidly punching Turles, just like he was doing to the tree. He was already able to drain some energy from the tree, and now he needs to do that to Turles. And Turles sees what's happening. He's somehow stealing the energy, the energy that he stole. That's supposed to be his. He rightfully took it from Namek, and he doesn't want Kakarot to take it back. He tries fighting as much as possible, but Kakarot is too far ahead of him now, and he's been weakened, weakened to a point where he even returns to his base form. How is this possible? He was just ahead, ahead by so much too, but now he can't do anything. And Kakarot knows what he must do. He can't hesitate. He needs to end this now while he's ahead. He doesn't want Turles to pull another trick again. So he then teleports right in front of Turles throwing a punch, but fainting, and then teleporting right behind Turles. Turles turns around, seeing Kakarot's hand in his face, immediately followed by a blinding flash of light. With one single attack, Kakarot eviscerates him, killing the evil Saiyan. The entire planet begins glowing as the energies return. The tree shrinks even more and more, and Kakarot punches it more as well to speed up the process. Spear of Vision was great here. It was the perfect match against Turles. And he's glad that he was able to reverse the effects of this, not only defeating this enemy and getting a great fight while he was at it, but also being able to defend this planet. Beerus and Whis watch on too, impressed, as are Shin and Kabito. They knew Kakarot definitely had it in him. Nails watching on too from the sacred world of Kai's. Once again, Kakarot found a new way to impress him. Who would have thought that he would have turned out like this? A godly figure with such great power. One training on the Supreme Kai's, a god of destruction and an angel. Making so many friends along the way, not just on Namek, but on Earth, with other Saiyans, going to places like Yardrat. It only reminds Nail of how amazing his student is. No, that's not even the proper word. Kakarot is his son. Adopted or whatever, that's what he is. He's family. Regardless of who his actual parents are and that he is a Saiyan, Kakarot's a Namekian just like all the others. And it makes Nail wonder, what if he never ended up on this planet? What if he ended up somewhere like Earth or something? Ah, uh, that would be kind of crazy. All he knows is he's glad that it turned out this way. And after all that fighting, Kakarot needs to show off this power to someone. Of course, he shows it off to Beerus, Whis, Nail, Shin, Kibito, all the people that he can think of but he knows exactly who he needs to show it to next. Raditz would be impressed by this. He goes out to find his brother. And it turns out now, Raditz is actually commanding Vegeta and Nappa. It's a weird twist of fate, but they're working alongside him, also trying to learn Super Saiyan 2 while they're at it. Raditz is their leader now. They never would have expected this. And Kakarot simply asks them, do they want to have a fight for old time's sake? No high stakes, no nothing, just for fun. And they're all thinking the exact same thing. As the four of them prepare for their fight, this is where we'll end off this series. So, what did you guys think about this part in the series as a whole? Leave any thoughts in the comments below. I'd love to see what you guys think, and hopefully you enjoyed watching the series as much as I enjoyed covering it. And if you liked the video, be sure to drop a like. It lets me know that you like more series like this, and it also really helps out the channel. If you haven't already, why not subscribe? As well as hitting on the bell icon so you're notified about any future uploads on my channel, including more videos like this one, including what ifs, or just anything else that's similar. As usual, I'd like to thank you all for watching, thanks for supporting the scenario all the way through, and I'll see you all in my next video.